Oh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's event. Uh, my name is Ben Foley and I'm one of the Arise volunteers who's helped organise today's event. Um, the event is called Making Another World Possible, an internationalist agenda for the left and for Labour. Uh, and the events of the past two weeks, on top of the extraordinary sort of past two years of the pandemic, mean it's vital that we gather together, discuss through what's happening, what's driving it, and how we organise on an international basis in response. We're living in a world of global inequality where the West and the so-called advanced countries uh, continue to prioritise spending on their militaries and bolstering the profits of multinational corporations at the expense of lives in other countries. While the West pursues profit, even in global crises such as the pandemic uh, and in climate change, others suffer. Wealthy nations are prioritising their own economies and placing burdens on those lower income countries, even when millions of lives are at risk. So we're gonna talk through a range of issues today, including looking at wider global inequalities in dealing with climate change, vaccine injustice, the need to build voices for peace and the continued struggle of women for liberation as we approach uh, International Women's Day. We need solutions that will challenge the global financial order and finally put public, uh, we'll put people and public solutions first rather than private profit. We've, uh, we've got three sessions. First, uh, the one we're about to start is the global struggle for climate and vaccine justice. Second, at 2.15, uh, we've got build voices for peace, no to war, no to nuclear weapons, and refugees are welcome here. And third, at 3.30, we've got a closing rally, with, uh, which is entitled Women for Peace, Global Justice and Socialist Change for International Women's Day. Um, if you're watching on YouTube or on Zoom, uh, you can stay on the same link. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, there's a different link for each session for you to click on to. Um, there will be a chance for questions, uh, so please put those in the Q&A um, throughout the session and we'll, we'll pass them on to the chair and make sure they can see them. Um, and we're also, I have to say this, we're also looking for any financial support you can offer. These events are all volunteer run, but we do have to spend money on some of the technical side of things to make them work. So when you see the link appearing, please do uh, make a donation if you can afford to do so. Um, so that is enough for me. That was just a short intro. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the chair of our first session, who is a member, and he's once again a candidate for, uh, so do give him your support, uh, Labour's National Executive Committee. That's Mish Rahman. Mish, over to you. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, good to see you and good to see uh, all these comrades on a Saturday afternoon. As Ben said, my name is Mish Rahman. I'm a member of Labour's NEC and also Momentum's NCD, and I'm so pleased to welcome you all to this session entitled The Global Struggle for Climate and Vaccine Justice. And this is the first session in today's Making Another World Possible, an internationalist agenda for the left and Labour event by Arise. Now, the COVID pandemic and climate crisis shows more than ever that we need a world that's based on cooperation, that's to tackle the big challenges of our times. But the Tories are continuing to cut international development spending, and they've been an international barrier to vaccine equality globally, putting the lives of people all around the world and here at risk. So that's why today's discussion is so important. We're delighted to have such great speakers and campaigners who are gonna join us for this session and to bring people together for this vital discussion on how we advance a progressive and socialist internationalist agenda. So in this session, we're going to have speakers looking at the global climate justice movement and on the need to tackle the horrendous vaccine inequality that we see across the world at this time of the global pandemic. And as this session goes on, please feel free to post your questions in the comments below the stream on YouTube and in the question and answer section on Zoom. And we're going to put them to uh, our panel. Please also note that if you're on Zoom or YouTube calls, stay throughout the day on the same link. Uh, you joined or come and go as you please, but also don't forget to donate at the link provided so Arise can continue to host these important events and support the other campaigns and links put in the chat throughout the event. So we've got some brilliant speakers today. We've got four brilliant speakers for this vital discussion on the crisis and the alternative will. And we're going to introduce uh, you all. And first of all, what we're going to, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Sean. Errington from Labour Assembly Against Austerity. Sean's an excellent comrade and the floor is yours, Sean. 
Thank you very much, Mish, um, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm going to start actually by focusing on a bit of the British dimension of the climate crisis. So tackling the climate emergency is a global issue and we need real international cooperation to tackle uh, to prevent climate catastrophe, as Mish said. Um, and that commitment has to include a commitment to tackling global inequality. And I know Assad um, is going to speak about the international movement for global climate justice and action later in this session. Um, but the reason why I wanted to focus on the British dimension to begin this session is as the host country of COP26 last year, and as one of the wealthiest countries in the world, which bears a great historical responsibility for the climate emergency that people are increasingly experiencing because any international green new deal will be built on countries actually transforming their own economies and we should be clear in placing demands on our own political leaders that they need to take radical and urgent action now on a scale that meets the challenge we face britain needs to be a world leader in tackling the climate emergency not continue to be one of the biggest villains of the peace in the months before Britain hosted COP26, a report from the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change outlined that the nation state commitments for COP26 would lead to a 16% rise in emissions by 2030, when they actually needed to fall by a minimum of 45%. So in the words of UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres at the time, it meant that we were hurtling towards a hellscape of an environment as we see the warning signs in every continent and region. You know, like really powerful language coming from the top of the UN about what was going to happen. And it wasn't a great run up in the coming together of the world and what was supposed to be a watershed moment for global cooperation in meeting the climate crisis. What needed to happen in practice at that event? Well, to achieve the life-saving goal of limiting global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees or less, the wealthiest countries in the world that have primarily caused the climate emergency needed to commit to immediate investment, legislation and innovation to start cutting emissions at, at least 7 percent each year. That obviously was not what happened last year and we've not seen anything like the scale of action needed to transition our economy brought forward by our government. So last June TUC analysis on GC countries spending found that per head of population our green investment in this country was just £180 per head compared to France at 711 Italy at 1389 and the USA at 2961 um, so you know we we know that we were already really lagging at the bottom of OECD uh, tables for investment. Generally, it's been long cited. Chronic underinvestment has been long cited as a problem in our economy. But actually, you know, given that it was, it is this massive problem. Given those horrifying figures about how much we're lagging behind and how much we need to scale up, what we've actually seen from our government since then is put them put in place a three percent limit on the amount. Uh, they're going to borrow to invest 3% of GDP limit on how much they're prepared to borrow to invest. So rather than scaling up, they're limiting what they're going to do. The rhetoric committing to build back better, to lead the world, and now levelling up is just that rhetoric. And we need, we've run out of time for presidents and prime ministers and political leaders to be negotiating over what's possible, realistic and affordable, and all the other euphemisms that get trotted out around for not doing enough. In the latest IPCC report that um, uh, took into account COP26, it came out just the other week, Guterres said that there had been a criminal abdication of leadership on this issue. And our government is very obviously included in that scorching assessment. I think it places a responsibility on protesters, campaigners, trade unions, activists and all of us to win in Britain the fight for a Green New Deal here and abroad. The market has failed to do what's needed to tackle the climate emergency, just as it cannot deliver social justice or equality and will keep on failing to do so. The solutions to the climate emergency will not be found in these markets, and it's only by providing wealth and power to working people and our local communities in all our diversity we can find those solutions. We need these socialist solutions to climate chaos, with our climate aims indivisible from creating an economy that ends poverty and raises the living standards of all, with universal and comprehensive public services 
and investing in the real concrete improvements we need. After more than a decade of a conservative assault on our living standards, which has led to the current crisis, uh, cost of living crisis, this is exactly what we need. We need things like expanded, affordable and accessible public transport. We need to build council homes and insulating and improving all of our homes to a high standard. We need an energy system that's sustainable, provides affordable energy and is publicly owned and accountable. These are just some of the examples of how we could all benefit in real terms. And of course, in making sure all new jobs are good unionized jobs and distributed around the country so that communities that have been deindustrialized and underinvested underinvested in all benefit with workers with a workers led transition as part of a broader push to end all insecure and poorly paid work in this country. Yet we have a government doing the very opposite of all of this and the consequences of them continuing to be successful in doing so will be felt far beyond our shores. So it makes our organizing urgent and necessary. And um, so on that note, I'm going to finish and I'm going to hand over to the other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you for your contribution you're come absolutely right instead of lagging behind and putting limits our political leaders need to take drastic radical action and become world leaders on this crisis and only socialist solutions uh, can redeem us because as you say capitalism is failing us and we need climate justice we need global justice and that's an excellent segue on to our next speaker who is from global justice now is Nick Deirdre he's a democratic socialist Social, uh, I mean, the Global Justice Now is a democratic social justice program working as part of a global movement to challenge the powerful and create a more just and equal world. Uh, over to you, Nick. Thanks very much, Mish, and um, thanks everyone for coming today. Given everything awful that's happening in the world today, I, I'm I'm really pleased that you've you've hosted this session because I think. The global economy, which is something I've kind of worked on all my adult life, stands today more exposed um, than at any other um, at any other point in my life um, for, for for being what it is, which is the neo-colonial beast, which privileges capital over human need and human life, as all of the, the friends and comrades on the panel here um, know, and many of you in the audience know too, and, and which is frankly at this point driving us into the abyss. And the two Best examples of this are obviously the climate crisis, which Sean's talked about, and I know Asa's going to talk about, but also um, the, the other example being vaccine um, injustice or vaccine apartheid, um, which John and I are going to talk about. And I think that both of those examples show that even when a given political path is in the best interests of almost all of us on the planet, um, I'm not talking here about any radical uh, blueprint for global communism or anything, just a relatively straightforward set of actions we need to take to prevent mass death and preserve life on this planet, um, the structures of the global economy will block that action if it gets in the way of the seemingly God-given right for transnational corporations and the super rich to generate more wealth. So here's where we are with vaccinations today. In high income countries like Britain, um, pretty much three quarters of our populations have been fully vaccinated. Um, and of course, in Britain, um, also a very sub substantial part of our um, population has been boosted. Um, in low income countries today, 6% of the population um, has been um, fully vaccinated. And that's not because, as some argue, COVID-19 has affected us worse than it's affected other people. In fact, there was some really interesting research out this week um, from Oxfam, didn't get much coverage um, because of um, events in Ukraine, but um, which basically showed um, that you were more likely um, to die of COVID if you lived in a poorer country, just as, of course, as we already know, you're more likely to die of COVID if you're poorer in this country or if you're black or brown in this country. So why did this happen? I think first. Yes, because rich countries like Britain bought up every vaccine on the market very early, many, many times what we needed and left others um, with none. Britain was a prime example of this. You go back nine months, um, Britain had donated nothing, um, had exported nothing and was actually taking millions of doses from supplies that were meant for the global south. Even today, Britain has only donated a paltry 30 million um, vaccines, which is, is really almost nothing given global need. Um, so clearly there was a problem there um, in terms of how we thought about the rest of the world, simply in terms of you know, basic, you know, basic human compassion. But I'd argue actually worse than that, this happened because we have constructed over the last 40 years a global economy which consigns most people in the world to live by the dictates of the free market. 
We've created global rules which say to countries across the global south, look, you don't need to worry about manufacturing capacity. You don't need to worry about developing your economy. You keep growing your vegetables and digging up your metals and selling them to us cheap. Um, and don't worry, the market will provide for all of your other needs, you know, your needs like essential medicines in this case. Just as 150 years ago, British governments told people in on the Indian subcontinent, you know, don't worry about where your food's coming from, the global market will provide. And of course, when, um, when drought hit, the global market did not provide. In fact, it shipped food away from people who desperately needed it and created famines that caused millions of deaths. Um, a very, very similar situation today. We found again, in a crisis, the market does not provide at all. And even when that's blindingly obvious, when millions of people are dying of a, of a disease we can inoculate them against um, to, to save lives, um, we won't even take the straightforward action of suspending the monopoly rights that we've confirmed on big pharmaceutical corporations for a, even for a temporary period of time. Those monopolies um, are, have become sacrosanct for governments like the UK, and the UK remains one of the leading governments in the world, along with the European Union governments, um, that are preventing this action of suspending patent rights on, on COVID medicines um, and equipment that India, South Africa, and almost every global South country in the world, to be honest, are calling for. And the reason is, of course, those monopolies make a tiny minority fabulously wealthy. So three weeks ago, Pfizer announced its, um, its, its revenue from its COVID vaccine um, over 2021, $37 billion dollars. Pfizer brought in on this vaccine um, with its partner BioNTech last year. That makes it the most lucrative single medicine in the whole of history. It's a phenomenal, eye-watering amount of money. Um, this week, the People's Vaccine uh, Coalition calculated that over the pandemic, 40 new billionaires have been created selling vaccines, treatments, um, equipment, and PPE uh, for COVID-19 during a period when 99% of the world's population got poorer. 40 people have become billionaires um, off, off directly off the back of this pandemic. That's the kind of global rules that we've got. Um, it, they clearly favor a tiny proportion um, of the population while they drive the rest of us um, into poverty and, and, and dangerous levels um, of disease and climate change. But I wanna end on a note of optimism because this is very obvious now, not just to those of us following these issues, but to most people in the world. In fact, if you look at last year's um, United Nations General Assembly, governments from across the political spectrum got up and they were absolutely furious with the rich world. Speaker after speaker said, you failed us, your rules have failed us, the market has failed us. And some of those governments are starting to do things differently. So in South Africa, the World Health Organization is backing um, a really radical um, experiment by the standards of the global economy to set up a research and development hub. Uh, what they're trying to do is produce mRNA themselves. They're doing this, first of all, to try and produce mRNA vaccines for COVID. Um, they've asked Pfizer to help by sharing their know-how. They've asked Moderna to help by sharing their, their know-how. Remember, Moderna's vaccine was made entirely with public money. Um, it's, they have made this year, last year, sorry, 70% um, profit margin on that vaccine, and they still won't share it um, with the hub in South Africa. So they've just said, we're gonna do it anyway. The scientists have said they're going to do it anyway. In just six months, they have created and they think the technology that they need to be able to develop these vaccines so much for those pharmaceutical companies who said Africans couldn't do this. Um, and when they have control of this technology, it's not just going to be about helping them deal with COVID. It's going to be potentially about cures for malaria, for HIV, for cystic fibrosis, all of those diseases that they're suffering from that big pharma is not helping with one bit. So this is a real breach with the rules that are protecting big pharma. Um, and two weeks ago, the World Health Organization announced that it was going to share that information with countries across the world for free um, without patents so that they could begin working on this medical technology, too. This is a really exciting moment where we're breaking the stranglehold of big business from the bottom up because governments like Britain are preventing uh, really very straightforward, simple and moderate demands from, um, from being carried out at the World Trade Organization. So I think for those of us on the left, it's really imperative that we support um, and defend these projects because Big Pharma will come for them and will try to undermine these, these, um, these projects and um, like the one in South Africa. And um, we need to expose and denounce our own government for putting monopolies ahead of people's lives all the while claiming that they've helped vaccinate the world. And I think we need to begin building a movement to remove essential medicines from these free market rules. We need to break the monopoly and socialize research and development in this area of the economy, just as in this country 70 years ago, we removed our own health system from the grips of the market. Believe 
believing quite rightly um, that whether you live or die should not depend on the interests of big business, shouldn't depend on your level um, of wealth. Um, so we've got a tour coming up. Um, I really encourage people to have a look on our website and we've got some fabulous speakers coming over um, from Southern Africa um, to talk about this um, and how we can begin building this movement um, to take back control um, of our medicines and create a pharmaceutical sector um, that's in the interests of ordinary people right the way around the world, not the few shareholders that they currently represent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. That was excellent. Uh, you're right. Vaccine injustice is is just cat catastrophic. And uh, unfortunately, you're more likely to die if you're from a poorer part of the world. And if you are poor and the market doesn't provide for poor people, it takes away from those that need it the most. And you're right. We also need to expose our government for backing monopolies over people. Uh, I hope you stick around for questions, Nick. We've got quite a few questions heading your way after we've heard from our next two speakers. We've got people tuning in from all over the world. From We've got people from Chile uh, who have tuned in. We've got people from Exmouth, Hackney, Hull, uh, Keighley, London, Reading, Stroud, Tyne and Ware, all over the UK as well. <coughs> Thanks for joining us. We've got two more excellent speakers. Next, we've got one of my favourite MPs, uh, the MP for Hemsworth, who's one of the most experienced members of the Socialist Campaign Group, and is also a fellow member of mine on Momentum's National Coordinating Group. He's none other than John Trickett. John, over to you. Thanks so much, Conrad. Thanks to everybody organising this and to all the people who have come to listen to us. I'm going to build on the points that Nick was making, um, but we should also remember that the, the majority of people who died, even in the so-called advanced countries, were working-class people, people in poverty, people from... Um, ethnic minorities and others, we know the depth of the divisions in the world and in our societies too. But let me just start by reminding ourselves uh, what the Prime Minister's response to when he was asked to explain the amazing speed and success of the work which went into developing the vaccines against COVID. This revolting individual, Boris Johnson, went even deeper into the gutter than he's been, in my view, ever before when he said, the success of the vaccine was down to one thing, he said, capitalism's central ethos of greed. It was greed that did it, according to our prime minister. And there's no doubt that if greed was a central motivation, then whilst millions of us fell ill or tragically died, a few were well rewarded with the most fabulous wealth. And let's take an example. In late November, news emerged in South Africa of a new so-called mutant variant. Scientists across the world scrambled to understand the new strain. The rest of us reacted in horror, but it was like the old song for the pharmaceutical companies. You know the song, Happy Days Are Here Again? Because their share prices skyrocketed the minute that a new strain of the virus came into existence. Within a week of the discovery, the announcement, eight of the top Pfizer and Moderna shareholders collectively had become $10 billion richer. Yes, within a week. And Pfizer, just to take one example, had increased its market valuation from 160 billion in 2019 to 200 and almost 150 billion in 2021, an increase of more than 50%. The chief executives of the companies were paid astronomical amounts of money. Uh, AstraZeneca, the CX, 15.4 million. Pfizer, 15.5 million. Moderna, 9.59 million pounds a year. Per year, that's what they were receiving in the last year. These explosions of wealth in big pharma they need to be understood in context. And the background to all of this, of course, is a pandemic which threatens really our common humanity. And a huge effort went into the collective search by scientists, clinicians, researchers, lab technicians and others, all drawing on the work of previous generations of researchers too. The truth is, isn't it, that there was an alternative ethos at play, not greed, but the altruistic search by people, brilliant people, working, working together in the common interest of humanity, that's what drove the research. But unfortunately, it's only part of the story because behind that selflessness, 
of thousands of brilliant minds lay another story, and that's the story of the relentless search for profits by shareholders and by corporate executives in the industry. But, and this has already been said, most of the research was funded not by the companies, but by taxpayers, you and I, all of us. The apologies for Big Pharma are claiming, well, you know, you need to make big profits in order to fund research and development. But in the case of the pandemic uh, vaccine, it's quite apparent that wasn't the case. Our own Secretary of State, Sajid Javid, made the argument that if you waive patent rights for the vaccine, then that will be a huge disincentive for the pharmaceutical companies to produce new products in the future. But, and here's my point, look at the details behind who, how was the vaccine paid for. The pharmaceutical companies put in less than 3% of the research funds, 97% was paid for by the taxpayers and to a small extent by charitable foundations. And then again, think about who it was who bought the vaccine from the, the pharmaceuticals, because there was no risk this vaccine wouldn't be purchased, was there? The customers were the same government acting on our behalf who'd funded the research in the first place. So what we had, let's summarize it, a need rooted in our shared humanity, research funded by almost every one of us, driven by brilliant research workers, and then a single monopoly customer in each nation. So 97% of research costs and 100% of customer costs fell on the public sector. But yet every single penny of profit was privatized into the coffers of Big Pharma. When you think about it, it's an absolute bloody scandal. And what's worse now is that our government and other governments too are building a kind of a wall around the companies, the pharmaceutical companies. The purpose of the wall is to protect corporate interests, not to protect human lives. And let's just remind ourselves, um, thinking about the, this issue on a world scale, it was Gordon Brown, the former prime minister, who said that the actions of the UK, the EU, were sort of neo-colonial in character, and he was right because the decision not to share vaccine patents left the poorer countries without the capacity, until we look at what's happening in South Africa, to produce their own vaccines in sufficient numbers and at cost price. It left those countries, the global South, dependent on supplies by big pharma or else upon charitable giving by states such as the UK, which has claimed it's distributing large numbers of vaccine to poorer countries. But the numbers we provided, they're not sufficient. And in any case, many of the vaccines, by the time they get there, are past their expiration date. And the WHO is predicting a shortfall of 3 billion doses across, of vaccines across the <coughs> poorer nations. And so there's anger in Africa and elsewhere too, rightly so. <clears throat> Less than, I think, 6% in Africa have had the vaccine. In some countries, it's uh, under 1%. But the apologists for Big Pharma are making a disgraceful, false and totally insulting suggestion that somehow the people of Africa and elsewhere are more resistant to having the vaccine than we are in the so-called advanced countries in Europe and North America. But it's manifestly untrue. <clears throat> and so it's time to put people before profits. It's time to waiver the vaccine patents, <clears throat> because unless... <clears throat> we make our vaccines available in poorer countries, then quite self-evidently new strains, maybe very dangerous ones, will keep re reoccurring. If we don't act now, then we will have turned our backs on the poorest of the earth. And in any case, no one is safe, as we know, until everyone's safe. But yet, look at the, listen to the, listen to the industry, listen to what they're saying. They're already salivating. Uh, the idea that we will need annual booster jabs against COVID, and maybe we do. But the poorer countries need it equally. It's just that the profitability for the company is higher here than it is in the so-called developing world. So let me just summarise. Big Pharma will claim it's acted in the interest of humanity in the case of COVID. Well, maybe, but their central imperative was to drive up shareholder value. And as we've seen, it's led to decisions which are far from humanitarian in character. It's time we call it out. But here is my final point. 
This is part of a bigger picture of a broken economic model, which is not operating in the wider interests of humanity as a whole. We need to be building a global drive for social justice, which will confront these matters and aim to transform this broken economic model. It falls on our shoulders to do that. Nothing less will do. And if we resolve one thing at the end of this meeting, it must be to become more active, more clear in our objectives, and more, if you like, confrontational to the way the system is working against our common humanity. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, John. Uh, those are just some phenomenal figures. Uh, billions and billions of pounds being pocketed by Big Pharma and that's research funded by us, as you say, and the benefits financially going to the monopolies. It is a scandal. It's an absolute scandal. And it's, it's also a scandal that neither political parties are saying or doing anything other than the few backbenchers like yourselves that have consciences. Uh, it's totally ridiculous. But thanks, John. Thanks for your excellent contribution. Next, I'm going to introduce, now this is Raman is introducing Raymond. Uh, uh, this is somebody who I really look up to, Assad Raymond from War on Once. Uh, who lead the fight against poverty and the injustice. And as a black Asian minority ethnic activist myself, it's the likes of Assad who have been doing it for decades that inspire activists like myself. And we really believe that we stand on the shoulders of giants and people like Assad have been doing it for a long time. It's a pleasure to introduce yourself. Assad, floor's yours. Thank you, Mish. And, uh, uh, and a great to see so many people here today, um, listening to all of my fellow panelists. And as we look around the world, I wanna just say, we should be filled exactly as John said, with absolute anger and rage. And I think as a progressive movement, we're absolutely not as angry as we must be. You know, Antonio Gramsci wrote once, you know, the old world is dying, the new world struggles to be born, and it is a time of monsters. And it is a time of monsters and their violence. These aren't monsters that are hiding under the in the shadows or under our beds. They stand in front of us, our political leaders, the billionaire class, the corporate giants, and the biggest monster of all, of course, our capitalist system. Racialized capitalism through its genesis, through slavery, colonialism, imperialism, today's brutal neoliberalism, sacrificing the poor, black and brown people in the global south and our planet in the pursuit of profit, creating not just a world riven with deep inequalities and equities, but a planet in which the question, can humanity survive, is now real. And as Nick and John spoke about, if we want to see how these monsters respond to a global crisis, we have no better example than seeing their response to the COVID and vaccine apartheid and profit for big pharmaceutical, a thousand dollars each and every second. And as Sean mentioned on Monday, a, uh, a report was published by the IPCC, it's called Climate Change 2022, Impacts, Adaptation and Vulnerability. It's an incredible 4,000 page report. And its summary is agreed word by, for word, line by line by every government in this report. So remember, what's agreed is a consensus report, right? Not the radical position, a consensus. The UN Secretary General described it as an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. For many, especially those on the front lines of injustice, the report simply reinforces what we've been saying for decades. Incremental siloed climate action is failing. Delay means death, that every second counts and every degree matters, that crisis is already here and that we're not all in the same boat when it comes to who's responsible for the crisis, who's being most impacted now and in the future, why they're being impacted and what action must be taken. The report is incredible. It's a dire warning that half the world, approximately 3.6 billion people, are already highly vulnerable to climate change. And that's going to increase to 75% of the global population. It covers a huge extent of issues, including that 150 of the biggest cities in the world have seen a 500% increase in extreme heat since 1980. And that already between 1.5 and 2.5 billion people are affected by water scarcity, and that will increase as temperatures rise. The report sets out that many of our ecosystems are already at the point of no return, and that 1.5 degrees, we will see the demise of overwhelming majority of coral reefs, irreversible loss of glaciers and polar ice. These critical ecosystems 
underpin the lives and livelihoods of the poorest people from everything from access to fresh water to food production. I'm originally from Pakistan. In Pakistan, we've had heat waves of 53 and a half degrees and the government dug mass graves. India's fifth biggest city ran out of water and 40% of the continent, 1.3 of, of billion people are now predicted to be without uh, access to fresh water in the coming decades. A million people starving last year in Madagascar in what was called the world's first climate famine, or in the Caribbean islands, losing 240% of their GDP from just one storm. That's every single school, hospital, road destroyed. How can we not be filled with rage? And this report is absolutely clear who's being impacted, who will be the hit the hardest. Those in Africa, Central America, South Asia and small islands, their citizens the poorest, the black, brown, women and indigenous are 15 times more vulnerable than those in rich countries like the UK. Hundreds of millions of people are going to be suffering from extreme weather impacts, food shortages, escalating economic damages and natural systems collapsing. And in a world where already 2 billion people face hunger and the climate crisis, as I said, is resulting in droughts and now climate famines, the report says climate change is affecting all dimensions of food security. Hunger, malnutrition and diet-related diet mortality will increase in the future with 80% of that at-risk population projected to occur in Africa and Asia. And as temperatures continue to rise, we're going to see feedback loops that will begin to kick in, that will unleash millions of tons of carbon as forests die back and permafrost thaws. That's going to be the equivalent of 15 years of greenhouse gas emissions. And that the impacts that we're going to see at 1.5 are irreversible. Yet we know we're currently heading towards a warming of the planet of at least 2.7 degrees with less than a decade left for the carbon budget for 1.5 and potentially another two for the decades left for two degrees. And our own government, like every other rich country, is promoting a mad goal of net zero by 2050. It's carbon colonialism, seeking even more of the remaining carbon budget which the global south need to try and lift their suits out, out of poverty, but also calculated to overshoot the 1.5 degrees threshold and then attempt to dial back temperatures through unproven, risky and dangerous technologies, which are basically a license to continue to pollute for the fossil fuel industry, industrial agribusiness and our corporate giants. And for the climate justice movement, it's always been clear that this crisis, climate crisis, is an intersected crisis of economic, racial, gender, social and economic justice, that it's our systems of exploited ecosystems, resource extraction and promotion of unsustainable economic growth that is driving this crisis and determines who faces the worst impacts. But now we have a report that evidences that. It states, and I quote, vulnerability is exacerbated by inequity and marginalization linked to gender, ethnicity, low income, or contributions thereof, combinations thereof. And this inequity and marginalization is recognized to be due to historical systems of injustice that shape the climate crisis. And I've got to say, I think it's the first for a climate report to state present development challenges causing high vulnerability are influenced by historical and ongoing patterns of inequity such as colonialism. Let me say that again. The world's climate scientists are saying that the systems of oppression such as colonialism are at the heart of determining who lives or dies. And at Monday's IPCC press conference, the climate scientists were very, very clear. The world we live in today is not the world we will live in in 10 or 20 years. And any further delay in concerted global action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. So absolutely, we must be filled with anger and rage. But I also say we must be filled with hope. You know, Grabsky also said, you know, pessimism, pessimism, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the world. You know, and comrades, we really cannot be pessimistic. We have to be the ones that are filled with optimism and hope. And it's exactly in the time of monsters that we have to stay true to our principles. The universalism of humanity, that solidarity and cooperation are the only answers to create in a world where everybody can live with dignity and in harmony with our planet. And our belief that it's when ordinary people come together that we have the power to change the world through our collective action. You know, everybody remembers that famous quote from Martin Luther King who says, you know, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Change takes a long time, but it happens. 
we all know that change has always relied on people with moral courage to stand up for justice, even when doing so was, was seen as unrealistic. We have to be the truth tellers. And when monsters stoke division and hatred, we must counter it with love and care for all of humanity. Our values have never been more important and we must stand by them. We have to be principled. We have to be internationalist. We have to be anti-imperialist. But hope also rests with us was being clear about our demands. So we cannot give up the fight for 1.5. That's rooted in equity and climate justice. We've got to call on the UK to do its fair share of action. That means real zero cuts by 2030 instead of blaming the global south least responsible for this crisis. But our demands have to go beyond saying, oh, no to fossil fuels. Instead, we've got to demand that everybody has the right to energy, equitable access to publicly owned renewable energy systems so we can end energy poverty for half the world denied that most basic right and, and for people here in the UK who are making decisions about whether they're heating their homes or putting food on the table for their families. It also requires us to be clear, you can't simply say, oh, let's have 100% renewable energy if it's based on the same model of material extraction and injustice as fossil fuel extraction. Incredibly, this IPCC report says we need a new social compact that addresses poverty as well as climate. So our climate justice demands must include the critical adaptive measures that determine vulnerability, access to universal public health systems, living wages and workers' rights, land rights for indigenous communities, the right to food and energy, the right to decent housing and health, and at a time of crisis, it's so easy to fail, fall prey to one, what many in the mainstream environment and climate movement argue. Now is the time for us to be pragmatic. Push for incremental change. Don't make bold change, calls for system change. This report shows how wrong that approach has been, how deadly that approach is, and how complicit in the failure to act that approach has been. So the call for climate justice cannot be just some empty slogan, something to tack on a banner or a leaflet. Climate justice means adopting a radical anti-colonial lens to looking at this crisis and recognizing fixing this crisis is only possible through radical transformative action. So we know that the major challenge both for the present and the future is political will. Political will is changed by political power. It means putting the most vulnerable at the center of our movement, workers and trade unions, and building the social license and pressure we need for a real justice transition. And that means, of course, not just thinking about what's happening here in the UK, but actually talking about fixing the global economy, our trade system, cancellation of debt, wealth taxes, and ending privatization, and. Uh, uh, now that we've seen action against the Russian oligarchs, well, we can see how easy it is actually to seize the wealth and assets of the billionaire class. Well, we've also got to talk about climate reparations and those neoliberal institutions such as the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank, who are already telling the global south as they respond to the COVID pandemic, be prepared for a new wave of austerity. Our antidote to, do, antidote to doom is to turn this into a moment of hope, that cooperation and solidarity are key. And this report says, it's only political pressure and campaigning. This is what the IPCC report says. It's only political pressure and campaigning that's going to make the difference. We've got to meet this crisis head on. And we've got to meet it with where the science tells us, with the urgency and, and, and tackling it as an intersectional crisis. War and Want and our partners, we've been committed to a radical global Green New Deal, a, an equitable response to 1.5, tackling inequality and poverty, living within planetary limits and undoing systems of injustice. Friends, comrades, change is coming. There is no doubt, and the report sets that out, it's now inevitable. The only question is what kind of change? Who will benefit? Who will be sacrificed? And in this struggle, we will face a choice. Be on the side of the monsters or join us and be on the side of people, planet and justice and allow that birth of the new world we all desire. And that means a powerful movement, a movement for justice, a radical anti-imperialist movement that is both red and green. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Assad. That was brilliant. We, you're right, we've got to be clear in our demands. We have to remain principled. I've got so many questions for our excellent panel. I've got people tuning in from Brighton, Henley, Norwich, Peterhead near Aberdeen, Weymouth, Wolverhampton, Barnsley, the Wirral and Essex. 
So we've lost uh, John Trickett, unfortunately. He's had to dash off. We've still got Sean. We've got Assad. We've got Nick. Uh, we've got a question. Uh, I think you all might need to pop in uh, to this one. Uh, it's a question from Andrea. Uh, it says, good afternoon, comrades. Does the panel have a view on the role of war and weapons, including but not exclusively nuclear, in climate change and environment degradation? What can we do? Uh, if anybody wants to have a go at that. If not, uh, Sean, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't know if we were doing one question at a time or round. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this one and then I'll, I've got two more and then I've got to do it. But I think this one's been there for a while, so best answer okay. that one. Um, I will be uh, very quick and I'm sure uh, Asad and the others have something to say on this, but I would say that they are mutually reinforcing. I highlighted in my notes the amount of investment that the government such as ours is not making in transforming our economy into one that is sustainable, um, you know, goals which would also improve our lives in a whole host of ways. Um, but they are choosing to invest and expand uh, the machinery of war. And that has been a trend for very many years. So just the other year, um, our government announced that it was include, uh, increasing our nuclear capacity by 40%. That's obviously investment that could be made uh, better use of elsewhere in transforming our economy into one that is sustainable. Um, and the use of weapons and war, it definitely has an environmental impact and degradation and adds to refugees and uh, crisis in humanity around the world. But I would also say, I think, I think Assad's speech really highlighted it really well. As resources become scarcer around the world, and we know that war is always done for resources or land, we're going to see the climate crisis fuel and become the reason for more conflict and wars and global instability. So I would say actually the two go hand in hand to build a more peaceful world. We need to ensure that we have climate and social justice and the link between the two is very, very strong. Thank you, Sean. I see Assad's got his hand up. There's another question uh, for you to add to that as well, Assad. So in addition to that, there's a question specifically for you. Uh, COP26 being such a failure has really disillusioned me in terms of seeing if climate protests here can make a difference. Are there still global movements that can have the power to shift the situation in places such as the US and Brazil? So if you could add that to your answer as well, Assad. I bet I've got a question for Nick as well coming up. Thanks, uh, uh, Rish. Uh, let, let me just first start with the militarism one. Look, um, we know this transformation requires a huge amount of money, right? And uh, it's uh, uh, going back to the COP, um, you know, rich countries haven't even met their promise of 100 billion, right? Uh, majority of that's just not been met. The majority of that is already in debt creating loans. Um, yet we've spent something like 6.9 trillion in the last two decades on war, right? Uh, we have the military, which is, if you calculated the greenhouse gas emissions just of the military, it would be probably the fifth biggest country in the world, if you calculated about the US military itself. So we know there are many, many dimensions, right? The fact that one of these jets, you know, in one hour burns more, creates more carbon than somebody driving their car for like 10 years, right? You know, th there are so many different dimensions, but the most important dimension, I think, of the connection between this and, and, and what is that the military, if you look at the people who are writing the first climate reports, they have been the US military. And what they were saying is basically, we know the system isn't going to change, what we have to do is create an armed lifeboat. We have to protect, right, the global north. And the response that is being put out, you know, um, we all, you know, of course, we took to the street when Trump said, build a wall, right? But do you know who wrote the first report that called for a build a wall? It was the US military who predicted 20 years ago, began writing reports and said, as temperatures increase, we will see forced migration of people from the Caribbean and Latin America. The answer is a wall between us and Mexico and more border security. And in fact, that drove 
increasing spending in, 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 in border security. And we see that. We see that across Europe with Frontier X. We see that how Europe is militarizing its borders, right? And we also see that playing out in how the far right talks about the climate crisis, because they're not climate denialists. I mean, some are, but the majority talk about this as being the moment of basically ethno-nationalism, a retreat, retreating and saving you know, the global north and allowing the global south to, to burn. So there is both a political imperative for us to say, actually, we need to be redirecting military spending towards actually a world of solidarity and cooperation. There is a political imperative for us to challenge the idea of militarism as being the solution, both to the climate crisis and all of these other crises. And of course, there is an importance in terms of just from a very practical level of cutting and um, cutting their emissions. Look, most of us were very, very disappointed in, of course, in the in the COP outcome. But you know, it's I've always took the position that the reason we see uh, an outcome that we don't like in, in the COP is ultimately a question about power, right? It's always been a question about power. Why are we not strong enough to force political leaders to deliver the action that we need? And we've always, for 20, 30 years of the climate justice movement, we said that the reason we don't have enough power is because the movement has been constructed in a way with vision and demands that have been about polar bears and icebergs, that has been about alienating working people, that has been talking about climate as an abstract uh, you know, scientific issue, rather than fundamentally talking about things like demands for warm, home, uh, warm homes, free insulation, free public transport. So our challenge is building a movement in this country that is actually a radical climate justice. We began to do it, right? Those 150,000 people who marched in Glasgow were manifestly different from an environment movement. They were a movement of working people and of justice. And of course, as much as the UK government tried its best to take off issues on the, uh, the UN climate, talk, we as a movement put them on. This was, I think, the most radical climate justice movement in the global North we've seen. Now, is there hope? Look. In Chile, the cradle of neoliberalism is now going to be the graveyard of neoliberalism as people's movements took to the street, rewrote a constitution, and we have now a government that is actually saying we are going to break away from neoliberalism. The fact that 250 million farmers took to the streets in India and stopped the corporate giants and the far-right fascist government of the BJP handing over control of food to corporate giants. This is where hope is, right? The fact that people actually all around the world are actually fighting and campaigning. Our job is to amplify those voices and connect our movements. Too often our movements have been in terms of siloed movements, and that's not been the case in the global south. So I, this decade, you know, I think it's going to be a decade of both protest and radical transformation. And so I'm hugely optimistic. And the COP is ultimately a symptom, right? There's, it's going to be, it's going to deliver what we want when we are more powerful. So we have to be more powerful and then we're going to get what we want in these multilateral uh, uh, negotiations. Thank you, Assad. Nick, uh, I've got two questions for you. One is from... Uh, there's a question from Tom on Zoom, uh, which is quite relevant to the issues around Big Pharma that we were discussing. What can we be doing about the creeping privatisation of the NHS? And also, uh, how does the ongoing massive third world debt crisis affect countries' ability to tackle the issues that we are talking about? Nick, any ideas? Yeah, I mean, two great questions. I mean, obviously, we need to do absolutely everything we can to defend the NHS. I think it's really interesting. We, we in this country, unlike, you know, almost every country in the world, you know, have basically have a socialist healthcare system. I mean, it's it's in, and, and I, what I find particularly incredible about that is it's one of the most cherished aspects of of the British state. It's one of the most cherished um, public institutions we have. It's a really good example, actually, of how the sort of stuff we're arguing for can um, be incredibly popular. And, um, you know, I, I, I obviously understand that the NHS is being gradually dismantled, privatized, marketized, more and more private players going into it. But nonetheless, you know, successive governments, um, particularly Tory governments, obviously have really, really struggled to do what they want to do and completely get rid of it. They can't stand the fact 
um, that we have this much loved institution at the heart um, of, of this country, which is completely antithetical to their own values. And so we have to do everything we possibly can um, to, to, to defend that. I actually think one of the reasons um, that people in this country are, are, are less angry um, about the big pharmaceutical companies is because the NHS in a sense protects us from seeing just how greedy these corporations are. You talk to many Americans, many ordinary Americans that absolutely hate the pharmaceutical industry. It's one of the most loathed sectors um, in the United States and Pfizer particularly is one of the most loathed companies within that, um, within that sector. And that's because they fully understand the way these pharmaceutical companies operate because they, they have to unfortunately live in a marketized um, health system um, where they see um, just what it means um, essentially to be dependent upon this, this sector for, for whether you <laughs> live or die, suffer or, 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 or can maintain your health or not. So I think we do have to do that. There are wonderful um, organizations out there like Keep Our NHS Public that are doing everything they possibly can um, to defend the NHS and yeah, completely encourage people to get, um, to, to, to get involved in those organizations and defend it because you're right, the kind of stuff I'm talking about um, is, is not in any way in contradiction with defending our system here. This is a, it's a shining light, really, um, for much of the world um, in terms of how you can, if you, if you build enough support, build enough of a movement, build enough power, um, create a system um, in, in which the market is, is to some degree eliminated. Um, from our from our healthcare, so incredibly important. Um, the debt crisis is huge, and I we work a bit on it. We we um, we haven't seen this, I think, as much in the media and popular movements over the last year as we might have done. Um, but already going into COVID nineteen, um, dozens of countries were experiencing debt crisis, and that has only worsened um, during the last two years. There were. Um, plans um, which were implemented by um, the richest countries in the world to postpone, to kick down the road, if you like, that debt crisis, to say we won't take payments during the pandemic. Um, the most incredible thing to me is that we never forced the banks, the hedge funds, the players in the city of London to join those schemes, even those very moderate schemes for the postponement of debt payments, which was not enough anyway. But during the pandemic, big financial players like BlackRock took billions of dollars out of some of the lowest income countries in the world in debt payments when they desperately needed that money to bolster their own health spending, to protect the lives and livelihoods of their own citizens. And that's the kind of world we live in where they're, again, the supposed rights of those big investors, those big financiers trumps the desperate need of countries to protect the lives and livelihoods of their own citizens. And it's just wrong um, we have got a number of protests coming up, actually, including um, including one aimed at um, BlackRock um, in, in coming weeks. Again, take a look at our website. I'm very happy to provide more details to anyone um, who wants it. It'd be great to see you um, getting involved uh, in this movement um, to cancel this debt. Um, but I, I, I absolutely can I, think so. Can I just yeah. quickly ask you, Nick, uh, just, just in addition, do you think a nationalised pharmaceutical industry is a viable solution? I do, yeah, yeah, I, I, and I'm, what I'm saying there, Mish, is not that we necessarily need to take over everything that the pharmaceutical. Like, I don't particularly mind if the government, you know, produces suntan lotion or not, um, but I think when it comes to essential medicines, I absolutely think that that needs to be socialised completely because, like John said, we are pouring in so much of the money from our taxes anyway. The pharmaceutical industry does not do the most risky parts of the risk. We have this crazy notion that, you know, capitalism is all about, you know, taking the risks that the public sector would ne in its sclerotic state would never be able to take. You just look at the financial pharmaceutical industry and see what, what nonsense it is, because it's the public sector that does all the most risky um, development. And you know, vaccines before COVID-19 were a complete backwater. I mean, for the pharmaceutical industry had no interest um, in, in vaccines, had no interest in any of the diseases that might um, create a pandemic because what it was interested in is creating the next blockbuster cancer drug um, that may have very little um, advantage over the one that we've already got but they know they're going to be able to charge whatever the market will take for those drugs um, the pharmaceutical industry over the last five years has poured way more money into making their shareholders rich in dividends in stock buybacks um, than they have done into researching um, essential medicines that we need so it's, it's failing it's failing even it's incredible to me that many people think if you even threaten nationalization or you talk about socialization of this industry you're going to kind of kill the goose that lays the golden egg it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what the pharmaceutical industry is today in many many ways they are more akin to hedge funds 
than they are to research and development units. And we are all gonna suffer as a result of this. It's not just COVID, it's not even just diseases that affect people in other parts of the world. Look at antibiotic resistance. That could be killing tens of millions of people by 2050. The pharmaceutical industry has no interest in researching new antibiotics um, because there's not enough money in it. So we're having to do it anyway. So absolutely, why not have a system that actually works for us from beginning to end as a, as a socialized system, um, rather than allowing these companies to make vast profits out of our, out of our taxes? While, while, while I've got you, Nick, 20, 20 seconds, if you could wrap up your last message, but I'm going to go to Asad and Sean, we're coming to the end of our, so if there's, a, if there's a quick plug you want to make? Yeah, I, I, one of the things I want to say is, look, I, I think this is, um, it's an incredible moment, like Asad has said, to, um, to try and communicate with ordinary people that this global economy is not in any of our interests. It's particularly bad. Um, for those who are poorest in the world and those who are poorest in this country. Um, but actually, when you're talking about threatening our very um, existence, our ability to fight off basic diseases um, that form the, you know, have formed the basis of our medical knowledge for 100, 100 years or more, it's really clear that this system does not work in anyone's interest. So I, I'd like to encourage all of us to be, you know, act local and, and, and think global is still really, really important. Um, we are living in one world and, and getting involved in a, a movement which is about fundamentally changing that world in solidarity with inspiring activists from around the world is, is, the, only way, is the only way to go. We cannot solve these problems just within our own, within our own country. Thank you so much, Nick. Sean, quick question for you. And then if you could also wrap up, you're from Labour Assembly Against Austerity. Will the Labour Party under Keir Starmer address the oil companies and stop the fossil from not fossil companies from not paying taxes and start to take responsibility to killing the planet? What's your message to Keir Starmer uh, on this? And if you could wrap up as well. Uh, I mean, I hope they do. <laughs> I think all of us hope they do. That's, but a, I think that's a question I, from Mark, by the way, on Zoom. <laughs> um, I mean, I actually, I mean, I'll sort of wrap this answer up my concluding remarks because actually I think like as Asad said um, and Nick, actually I think around the world you're seeing huge, huge, global movements and really inspiring and reasons to be optimistic actually and I think even in this country over the past like five six seven years we've seen a massive politicization of ordinary people talking about politics and being involved in politics and particularly amongst younger people like actually none of us mentioned I, I don't think the Fridays for Future but actually children walking out of school, um, you know, and even like during the pandemic, you saw kids like protesting their GCSE and A-level grades. I think there's like a new generation that's coming up that is learning that protest can work and is powerful and are really recognise the dangers in the future, but are also really determined to claim their future. So I think all of those things are reason to be powerful. And I think actually it's those actions and movements that will shift all of our political leaders and all of our political parties. So that's where I will finish. I hope people stay for the rest of the day because I think it's been a great first session and I'm looking Excellent. forward to the rest of it. Thank you so much, Sean and Asad. Uh, if you could conclude, but before that, if you could make a quick 30 second comment on the global refugee crisis and what our government should be doing about it. I know 30 seconds isn't enough, but. So, you know, again, this IPCC report talks about, you know, climate induced uh, uh, migration, etc. And says, you know, uh, something like uh, 80 million people have for been forcibly displaced from uh, sorry, 20 million people from just seven extreme events. Look, the reality is the in, in, International Organization of Migration says that yeah, potentially one in 30 people are going to be displaced in the coming decades. Now, the overwhelming majority of people who are displaced are displaced internally within poorer countries, right? They don't never cross borders, right? And of course, we can look at Ukraine now, you know, one thing we can say, oh, Actually, it's quite easy for people to open borders, right? Actually, it's quite easy for actually people to be welcoming. And, and we all know that the hypocrisy of the very borders that are being opened still have people fleeing wars of Syria and Afghanistan, dying of herpethermia on the borders of Poland, and that Europe has still got its walls and fences all around it for other people. But I think this is the question, right, in terms of our, our argument around migration. You know, there's a lot of people who use migration as sort of like the scare thing right 
we've got to act because otherwise all these people are going to be at our borders. That's not true. That's not what people are going to be coming. And just coming back to that, that point about even the NHS, I think this is a movement for us to bring together our domestic demands and our international demands, right? And we have to be honest that the progressive movement in the UK has largely forgotten its internationalism, right? Over the last decade has been so focused on, and quite rightly on some fights, but has just ignored everything about the global trade economy, is about what's happening in the rest of the world. We have to rebuild that back. And the way we can do that is, yes, we must fight, for example, an NHS here, but why don't we also say NHS here, and a global NHS. We know that that's fundamentally the most critical solution to both tackling inequality, to tackling climate, and to tackling displacement of people. We know that living wages is the most important adaptive measure. So when we fight for 15 pound an hour here, we should at least be saying $15 a day for workers in the global side. And our job is when we say to our, these companies and corporations, because overwhelmingly they're based here in the UK, and that's what our Global South Movement says, why aren't you saying I'm campaigning against the very corporations, the, the companies that are listed on your FTSE 100, your government, and because they are the ones, we'd, they'll say we're doing the resisting, but the transformation you, needs you to do that. And that's obviously what War and One does a lot of and, and Global Justice Now and all of our progressive movement. We need to be bigger and stronger. So this is the moment, I think, you know, yes, it's amazing with the climate strikers, absolutely with Fridays for the Future. But if we allow movements not to not to be part of that, to just simply say, that's really great, all the young people are protesting, this actually needs all of our progressive and the left movement with our radical anti-imperialism and our history of radical anti-imperialism to bring that back, to be able to even tell people the story. Why is it that many countries in the global South are where they are? It's not because they were accidentally like this, it's because we deliberately created Abnala. It was our structural adjustment programs. It was the fact that we overthrew and murdered the leaders of countries in the global south, whether it was, whether it was Allende or yeah. Mossadegh in, in Iraq yeah. or, or, or Lumumba in Congo. I think there's a importance of storytelling that is really, really important to this moment. We've, we've, what got, is to end it, end, we've got to end it. Sorry, there, so don't finish, worry. Sorry. No worries. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for participating. That was a great session. I had great enjoyment listening to all our speakers. And it's really important that we on the left need to be clear that to win again, as our speakers have laid out, Labour must be a clearly internationalist party, including for international cooperation that against climate chaos and global inequality, including vaccine inequality, as has been mentioned. And as well as being active in Labour, we need to be active in and build links with those movements for a better world, such as one war on one, such as Global Justice Now, CND, Jubilee Debt, Stand Up to Racism, the campaign against climate change, and many more. And we need to firmly oppose the Tory government on all aspects of its reactionary agenda. And for all the latest on these campaigns and from the organisations and the great people speaking here today, be sure to read and follow our media partner, Labour Outlook, Please also take on board the action links that are being posted in the chat and please keep on donating at the link provided so we can continue hosting these important events. Please stay online. The next session starts promptly at quarter past two. So if you need to go for a quick comfort break, go there, come back. The next session is build voices for peace, no to war, no to nuclear weapons and refugees welcome here. And just like this lineup, the next lineup is going to be just as good as well. Thank you, comrades. Take care. Now I'm off. To, I've got to run. I've got to go to the Villa match. They're kicking off at three o'clock. <laughs> <laughs>
Hi everyone, this is, uh, my name's Ben, I'm one of the volunteers helping with today. This is just to let you know we'll be starting the next session shortly. Um, the next session is entitled Build Voices for Peace. No to war, no to nuclear weapons and refugees are welcome here. Uh, our panel is going to be uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Richard Bergen, Jess Barnard from Young Labour, Sophie Bolt from CND, uh, Murad Qureshi from Stop the War, uh, and Sabi Dali from Stand Up to Racism, and your chair is going to be Matt Wilbris. Um, so we'll be starting this session very shortly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you today to this session, um, which is entitled Build Voices for Peace, No to War, No to Nuclear Weapons, Refugees Welcome Here. I'm Matt Wilgus, a volunteer for Arise and also the, part of the editorial team at Labour Outlook. Um, as, as we meet today, we are going through a time of major crises and emergencies, and we are here throughout the day to discuss the need to put forward ways to transform our world, putting people, health, planet first. We need a world where global and social justice is the norm, standing up to all those leaders who promote the policies of inequality and war. The Labour movement has a proud tradition of standing for working together internationally for peaceful solutions, global justice and in international solidarity, including solidarity for refugees, as expressed in the title of this session today. Arise itself is a celebration of our values of peace, internationalism, solidarity and unity, and it's important to have this discussion today in the current circumstances. It is the time where, as Kate Hudson of CND said this week, we are seeing an ongoing disaster for the people of Ukraine. The death toll as a result of the Russian invasion is mounting, and we mourn the loss of all those killed in this unnecessary and illegal war. Here, we need to build voices for peace, warning of the dangers of escalation, including the threat of nuclear catastrophe, as some of our speakers will focus on. Due to the high level of interest, as well as this Zoom webinar, we are streaming live direct across the YouTube page and numerous Facebook pages, and it's great to have so many hundreds of people join us today. As the session goes on, please post your questions in the comments below the stream on YouTube or on the Q&A section in Zoom, and we'll try and get to some at the end of the session. Um, without any further ado, I will now go on to our first speaker, who needs a little introduction. It's Richard Bergen, MP, Secretary of the Socialist Campaign Group of MPs. Welcome, Richard. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. And I want to start off by uh, thanking Matt uh, and Arise for uh, organising uh, today's uh, event. Now, we all want to see Labour winning the next election to implement a progressive agenda at home, one that undoes the damage the Tories have caused to our communities over the past decade through cuts to our public services, through underinvestment in our communities, through wage freezes and tax hikes on ordinary people while letting the wealthy off the hook. And just as we want to see a progressive Labour agenda at home, we want to see one in our international policy too. One that undoes the Tory cuts to foreign aid. One that is a force for good on climate change, which poses direct and current threat to everyone, and especially to hundreds of millions of the world's poorest people. One that supports greater access to vaccines, and one that pursues peace and justice around the world. So it's really important that we organise around these issues, sharing ideas and strategies for a progressive foreign policy. So well done to Arise for putting on today's event. And I'm sorry that after my contribution, I've got to leave to go to a, a constituency a commitment, but I hope the rest of the event goes well. But today, in my remarks, uh, I want to focus on the horrific situation in Ukraine, already in Ukraine, we see the appalling human suffering war always brings. So many people have lost their lives. Many more have been maimed and injured. Others terrorised by the bombs being dropped. People forced to flee their homes. And over a million people, a million people have had to leave their country. Others are now living without access to shelter, water, electricity, or other basics as a humanitarian crisis unfolds. We know ordinary people always pay the highest price for war. So today, on this call, 
we send our solidarity to all the victims of Putin's invasion. We demand an immediate end to the loss of life and suffering. That means the Russian state must call an immediate and permanent ceasefire and must withdraw its troops. And as the US, UN General Secretary has repeatedly said, instead of escalation, there must be a diplomatic solution to this dangerous crisis. A diplomatic solution that delivers peace, security and human rights, as well as doing all it can to help achieve that diplomatic solution, our government must also give real solidarity to refugees fleeing the war uh, in uh, Ukraine. These are dark times for the world, but the solidarity I have seen, that we have seen in recent days for Ukrainian refugees is a little ray of light. Last weekend, I visited the local Polish Catholic community center here in Leeds, where people had donated all sorts of essentials, toothpaste, clothes, bedding, sanitary products to those who've had to flee this war. If only our government was as generous as ordinary people have been. The way our government has delayed and restricted the rights of those fleeing Ukraine to come here is a disgrace. Solidarity with the people of Ukraine must include support for refugees fleeing the war there. Our government <coughs> must waive <coughs> all visa restrictions, provide safe and legal routes to come here. And the huge generosity from ordinary people should be a message to the government to start to give much greater support to refugees fleeing wars all over the world. Refugees fleeing conflicts are often driven by our government launching wars or selling weapons such as in Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq and elsewhere. Let this be the moment when we ditch the years of hostile environment and say refugees are welcome here. Of course, beyond the immense suffering in Ukraine, this is a very dangerous moment for the wider world. There is a real danger that this war in Ukraine could spiral into a wider war, creating even more bloodshed and suffering. For example, no fly zone would have to be enforced, which in reality would mean NATO countries having to shoot down Russian planes. We would then have the nightmare scenario of direct conflict between the huge military power of Russia and the huge military power of NATO countries. The full consequences of such a wider war are difficult to imagine. And of course, those consequences go beyond risking a wider conventional war. If we fail to de-escalate this crisis, and if we end up with a wider direct conflict, then it risks a nuclear war between the two biggest nuclear powers on Earth. We must never forget that today, Russia and the NATO countries have over 11,000 nuclear weapons between them. Some nuclear weapons today are 3,000 times more powerful than the nuclear bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Over 200,000 people, overwhelmingly civilians, were killed when the United States dropped those two nuclear bombs. Today, many more millions of people, tens of millions of people, could be killed in such a nuclear war. So at this moment, perhaps we are closer to a nuclear war than at any time in recent decades, we need to raise our voices to demand global action that leads to a world free of all nuclear weapons. With the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons having now come into effect, ratified by 58 countries, there's been some momentum for global disarmament. Let's build on that so that all nations, including all the biggest nuclear powers, also sign that treaty. Finally, I just want to extend a hand of solidarity to the brave protesters campaigning in Russia for an end to the war. During the wars on Iraq, on Afghanistan, on Libya, that caused so much death and destruction, we said, not in my name. And people in Russia are today bravely saying, not in my name. Who could not be moved by the scenes this week of the arrest of 76-year-old pensioner Yelena Ozipova opposing the war. Yelena survived the siege of Leningrad that killed an estimated 800,000 Russians 
in World War II. She knows the horrors of war and bravely opposes her government adding to the suffering. And she's far from a lone voice. I've seen press reports of demonstrations in more than 100 Russian cities with at least 6,000 people arrested amid a clampdown on civil liberties and basic freedoms. Those protests reflect the views of many more Russians who are just as appalled by this war as we are. Ordinary Russian people are not to blame for the actions of their government. A government of kleptocrats that represents the interests of the billionaire robber barons with their palaces and yachts paid for with the wealth stolen from the Russian people. Earlier this week, Progressive International circulated a statement by a new coalition of anti-war socialists in Russia, which I encourage everyone to read. I'm sure that it can be uh, put into the chat by the organisers. So let's stand with the Ukrainian people and offer our full solidarity during this horrific time. Let's stand with all those Russian activists standing up to their government by calling for an end to war. And let's stand with those across the world, all those across the world, pushing for an end to war, for a diplomatic solution, and for global peace and justice. Thank you, Richard. Um, and thank you for everyone joining us. Um, we now have over a thousand people joining us live across our platforms for this very important discussion. Um, we've got a number of speakers to get through, so I'm going to move straight on to our next speaker, um, a great friend and comrade of mine, Young Labour Chair, Jess Barnard. Thank you, Matt, and thank you to everyone at Arise for organising um, such an incredible lineup of events uh, at such an important time as well. And I think when, when Arise organised this festival, um, when I was approached about it a few months ago, I think very few of us could have predicted the horror that would be unfolding in, in the weeks following. Um, and so, of course, we need to send our complete solidarity to the people of Ukraine uh, and, of course, to the peace protesters across, across Russia who are risking their lives and freedoms to do so, to bring about an end to the illegal invasion of Ukraine. And, you know, the invasion of Ukraine and, and the, the vicious actions of Putin and complete contempt that he has shown for international law is absolutely disgraceful. And to, to, to be witnessing, you know, Ukraine's cities being bombed, homes and hospitals left in ruins, and the devastation across the country has shaken, I think, many, many people. And, and the, you know, the people of Ukraine being displaced now into their millions and spending, others spending days underground, sheltering from bombs that are raining down around them and on their homes. I think very few people here in the UK can imagine just how awful and painful that experience is. And I think, you know, the horrors of war are so often forgotten or understated uh, or, or dismissed, um, and particularly by self-serving leaders like Putin who, who hide behind nuclear missiles or who can send citizens in to war that they are supposed to be protecting, who will they know will die in their hundreds of thousands. And the threat, of course, of nuclear weapons, as I think shaken many, many people, and we are closer to a nuclear war than I think many of us have, have ever been or, or witnessed. And we must never, ever allow this to happen. We know that this will result in the murder of millions and millions of people. And not only that, but it will destroy our planet and it will, will steal our future. And so there is no situation where we should allow that to happen. And I think it's important to remember that overwhelmingly it is working class people, it is poorer people, it is ordinary men, women and children in Ukraine and in Russia that will suffer the consequences of this war and lose their lives. So wherever it may be in the world, we need to remember that war is never the answer. This suffering and brutality that we're seeing is never the answer. And war will always end in negotiations and diplomacy and Putin must be withdrawing now, and we must be insisting that he withdraws, and world leaders need to do everything in their power to bring about that peace through diplomacy now, not later. And I think we need to do everything we can to support the thousands of peace, pro peace protesters uh, across the world, and obviously particularly in Russia, who have marched against this war. 
and are insisting an end to the actions of Putin. And it is easy to feel powerless at times like this, I think, but we mustn't sit by while this crisis continues and we mustn't allow our government to not only shy away from, from their responsibilities, but to stoke up hostility and fear towards refugees and asylum seekers. And while we all know of Priti Patel's hideous record on this, our government, we may be aware, who have refused to waive visa requirements for Ukrainians, even in this moment of crisis, and even suggested that Ukrainians apply for seasonal work visas to access safe routes here, is completely unacceptable. And while we light up government buildings in blue and yellow, but our government at the same time drag their heels when it comes to any tangible action in providing safe and legal routes to refugees, we must hold them to account. And that goes for all refugees across Across the world. So it's time, I think, to redouble our efforts to end the hostile environment and call on our government to start putting people ahead of profits, to stop selling arms to countries responsible for the brutalization of others, such as Saudi Arabia. And we need to organize in our communities together to bring about a progressive approach. So don't just write to your MPs, whether that be a, a Labour MP or a Lib Dem or a Tory MP and you know, wait for some measly response or, or even be ignored. We need to demand action now, attend those constituency meetings, organize protests in your communities, do everything you can to make your voices heard that this is enough. And we want to be leading in the way of embracing refugees and ending a hostile environment. And as we witness the attacks on civil liberties of peace protesters in Russia, we absolutely need to redouble our efforts to resist the authoritarian legislation being brought in by our own government, which gives unprecedented powers to police to clamp down on protesters and criminalise them. We absolutely must do everything to resist this. And we need to be building a society that leads with peace, with safety, and of course, with international solidarity. And it requires all of us to unite to deliver that. So solidarity to the people of Ukraine. And thank you again to Arise for organising this. Thank you, Jess, very much. And thank you, everyone who's tuning in. Um, welcome to people from Barnsley, Brighton, Essex, Exmouth, Hackney, Henley, Hull, Keighley, London, Norwich, Peterhead, Aberdeen, Reading, Stroud, Weymouth, the Wirral, Wolverhampton, York, Iron and Ware, and people from countries such as Spain and Chile. And now I see Russia tuning in as well. Welcome to everyone. Um, our next speaker is someone from a very important campaign at the moment, and a campaign that both Arise and Labour Outlook are very pleased to support. Um, from CND, it's Sophie Bolt. Thanks very much, Matt. And it's really um, an absolute privilege um, to be here. Um, I think that this event um, is, is so important um, given, given the situation that we're facing. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's just um, amazing that Arise has organised this particular um, debate. Um, from CND, it's obviously an absolute priority to stop the war in Ukraine and save lives. And I think it's the absolute priority for the Labour movement too. The news that Russia has called a ceasefire today in two cities in Donetsk to evacuate residents is very welcome, although reports are coming in that the ceasefire in Mariupol has not held. It is vital that the ceasefire is resumed, extended across the Ukraine and made permanent, because all efforts must be focused on negotiation and dialogue. Silencing anti-war MPs and young Labour members only strengthens the voices calling to escalate this war. Voices from within NATO and the Tory party, and very, very um, distressingly, I think really, um, we're hearing the Ukrainian president, Zelensky now demanding NATO enforce a no-fly zone. Because far from saving lives, as Zelensky is arguing, it would risk thousands and thousands more. Former NATO Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, General Philip Breedlove, explains why. If you put a no-fly zone in the eastern part of Ukraine, and we're going to fly coalition or NATO aircraft into that no-fly zone, then we have to take out all the weapons that can fire into our no-fly zone and cause harm to our aircraft. 
So that means bombing enemy radars and missile systems on the other side of the border, i.e. Russia. And that, he says, is tantamount to war. Now, horrifyingly, having made that description of what a no-fly zone is, he's advocating NATO does just that. But let's look at where no-fly zones have been used and the consequences. In 1991, Britain and the US enforced a no-fly zone in Iraq, supposedly to protect the ethnic Kurds and Shiite Muslims. And that escalated into the full-scale US-led illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003. And we all know the horrific consequences of that. So we can't risk the Ukraine becoming the battleground for a proxy war between Russia and the US, spreading across Europe and risking nuclear war. So all voices must be heard if we are to find the exit route. And this means why understanding why NATO is part of the problem. Now, far from being the beacon of peace and stability, as argued by Starmer, NATO is a coercive nuclear armed alliance. Its expansion to now 30 member states across Eastern Europe is hugely damaging and destabilizing. Five NATO countries currently station US nuclear bombs, 150 nuclear bombs. But Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands have all tried unsuccessfully to remove them. Just last year in the German elections, the SPD and Greens called for their removal. So NATO allies, the US, UK and France flew in diplomats and the demand was dropped. But the huge opposition in these countries will not go away because they know stationing US nuclear weapons put puts them on the front line of any military conflict between the US and Russia. And this is why Britain and the US pushing NATO membership for Ukraine has been such a dangerous and destabilizing strategy and has contributed to the devastating conflict we're seeing in the Ukraine now. For over a decade, the US and Britain have pushed NATO membership for Ukraine, despite the Ukrainian leadership at that time opposing membership. In 2014, the president was ousted, unleashing huge unrest, deadly violence, which effectively split the country with the Russian speaking population over 30%, which are based in the east of Ukraine, voting to become autonomous. And what was NATO's response to this terrible situation? It sent, it sent in 15,000 troops to carry out hugely provocative joint military exercises. And despite attempts by France and Germany to secure a ceasefire, over 13,000 people have been killed. NATO membership is not in the interests of the people of Ukraine. In fact, two days before Russia invaded, the Ukrainian ambassador to the UK said it could be flexible about NATO membership in order to avoid a military conflict. Yet he was hastily forced to withdraw that statement. But he was right to try and secure peace because we all know the reality of NATO's defensive alliance. Just look at Afghanistan and its dangerous escalation risks us all. Johnson may play down Russia's threat of nuclear attack, but the, rest, the risk is very serious. If Russia launches a nuclear strike, the US could retaliate through the NATO alliance, or it could preempt an attack and launch one first. And nuclear bombs are far more powerful than those dropped on Japan by the US. Just one could kill a million people. And despite Sadiq's assurances, he cannot protect Londoners from the catastrophic human and environmental devastation nuclear war would bring. We're all on the front line in this war and we need the entire international community working to de-escalate the situation, secure a ceasefire and negotiate a political se settlement. We need the Russian troops out of Ukraine. So let's build unity with all those calling for peace in the Ukraine, in Russia and across the world. And I hope that everybody can join us tomorrow in the protests that are taking place around the country 
and in London calling for peace. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, and that's quite right. What we need is a push for peace. Um, I'm going to actually go straight back to Sophie before my speakers, because we've got a lot of questions coming in, but this one is specifically for Sophie, and it links to something you said at the end. Um, this is coming in Zoom. It says, a lot of people, including those in the media and some of our younger activists, aren't told what a nuclear war would mean in reality. Can you outline for us what the nuclear devastation in Hiroshima and Nagasaki meant and the scale of destruction that would mean in this situation today? Can you just give us a quick answer on that, if you don't mind, because it's quite a specific question for you, I think. OK, I mean, I have been to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and I have heard firsthand from Hibaksha, who are survivors of um, the um, nuclear bombs that were dropped um, and um, if you were in the epicenter of a, um, a nuclear explosion, um, then the temperatures are absolutely horrifically high and people um, were literally um, evaporated. Um, people talk about the shadows that they could see of people's bodies where they were literally obliterated by, um, by the, um, the nuclear blast because of these absolutely you know, huge, huge temperatures. Um, but beyond that, for those people who actually um, survive the blast, you then, of course, have nuclear radiation, um, which is absolutely toxic. Um, people, um, all their hair falls out, um, all their, their, their skin, you know, comes off um, and they have a generational, um, for those who do survive, they have generational cancers. This is not something you can just close the door on and be protected by nuclear radiation, um, kills millions of people and it's and it and it continues to be part uh, of poisoning our um you know our lands and our um and our, our generations so it's you know it's it's not something that can be contained it's completely indiscriminate thank you sophie and um please do follow the links to get involved with cnd in the chat everyone um our next speaker is from the former chair of the Stop the War Coalition, um, someone who would be familiar to all of you who regularly come on these events, um, the great campaigner, Murad Qureshi. Well, thank you, Matt, um, for uh, giving this opportunity with uh, a rise and, uh, and having the foresight to uh, set this before events globally took over. Um, there's no doubt we need space for progressive internationalists and i'm grateful for this uh, opportunity from arise now like many colleagues who have spoken already and those in attendance uh, i've already shown my solidarity with ukrainians and russians against putin's uh, invasion of the ukraine last weekend in front of the uh, the, uh, the, the russian embassy and i'll be joining tomorrow's peace uh, demonstrations as well, as I'm sure many others will be uh, attending today. Um, but look, I can't help being party political and personal about um, where we are today in, in the United Kingdom uh, in opposing Johnson's reactionary foreign policy and international agenda. Um, I've seen him at close quarters for eight years at City Hall and know what a fat, lazy sod he is, and it's continued quite honestly, all uh, during his time at Downing Street and before then, actually. Uh, you've got to remember when he was at Foreign Secretary at the Foreign Commonwealth Office, there was a literary of blunders and poor diplomacy by him. And the worst instance, quite honestly, is the way he let down a constituent, uh, a UK citizen, uh, Nagari Zahari Gratcliffe, uh, in representing her case against the Iranian uh, government's detention. Um, would you believe it? He's our PM now. Uh, and during his time as PM, what's he done? He's actually uh, increased military expenditure by about over 20 uh, mil a billion over the rest of the parliamentary term. Uh, that's uh, that's 2% of GDP uh, that uh, is required out of our uh, NATO membership. He's also increased nuclear warheads. Um, let's not forget, by 15% from 180 to 260 warheads, reversing years of progressive 
uh, moves towards nuclear disarmament, not only here in the UK, but globally, and also reducing aid from the 0.7% of GDP uh, and incorporating uh, a well-regarded Department of Government DFID into FCO control. And, and this really began um, in uh, last year when they had the integrated review of security, uh, defense, development, and foreign policy, uh, which was meant to be the tilt towards Indo-Pacific. Um, and with this, they formally set up the nuclear military partnership between the UK, US, and Australia, uh, and, uh, UCAS, uh, opening uh, the, the uh, a nuclear military uh, technical transfer to uh, Australian, Australia via nuclear power submarines, a clear breach of the Non-Proliferation Treaty as it exports nuclear, um, nuclear technology to Australia and bypassing um, many Asian countries who have uh, been not party to these agreements at all. So clearly we must oppose these breaches uh, to the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty on the streets and legal challenges as well, as I know uh, my colleagues in CND are doing. Uh, if there is uh, anything we have to be um, arguing for, it's essentially uh, an ethical foreign policy uh, along the lines that uh, Robin Cook argued for back in 1997 and was adopted uh, by the party in 2017. Um, so, we should be resetting the UK's diplomatic course to prioritise human rights, nuclear disarmament, as well as, well as halting arms sales to disreputable uh, regimes like the Saudi Arabians. Uh, I can't see why we can't be still doing that. And uh, if anything, events in the Ukraine have highlighted the need to, to, to do that even more so with the emphasis on human rights, nuclear disarmament, as well as halting arms sales to uh, uh, notorious regimes around the world. Uh, I hope to see many of you tomorrow at the uh, global uh, peace uh, demonstrations uh, against Putin's invasion in uh, Ukraine and showing solidarity to the many brave Russians who are saying in Moscow and St. Petersburg, not in our name. Thank you, Murad. And if you could just hang on as well before we move on to Sally okay. and then Jeremy, because there's a couple of specific questions for you. And I think it works quite well when they're specific to say them after. We've got one from Adrian on Zoom who says, could Murad raise a bit more on the issue of the Russian money that surrounds the Tory party, um, including in London and obviously from your experience on the GLA? And Alpha Matthews should be able to answer that. And then we have a second one. So um, they're quite broad. So you probably need the okay. answers. But this one says, you have spoken previously at Arise events, Murad, on the war on Yemen and the British role. What is going on now? It seems to have totally fallen off the news agenda. So two quite different questions, but both, I think, quite specific for you, Murad. Yeah, well, I, uh, thank you, Matt, for raising these questions at this stage uh, before we, the, the meeting moves on. Uh, it, it is very critical and very important that we not lose sight of the uh, the, the Russian rubles that have been going to the coppers of the Tory party. And it's not just nationally, um, it's also in, in London politics. In my part of, uh, in my home borough, the city of Westminster, uh, the, the, local, uh, the, the local Tories there have themselves been in receipt of £120,000 over the last few years. You, you have to wonder what that's for and what they're getting for it. Um, and it's something which I think should critically be borne in mind when we have these local elections on the 5th of May. Um, and the, uh, the, the other emphasis is that over the last 10, 15 years, there's no doubt uh, that uh, a, a lot of the, uh, the, the oligarchs in uh, Russia have got accustomed to, to be gi given the green lights to set up shop here in London. And suddenly now the Tories have realised to what cost and what it's meant, uh, not only to uh, to uh, Ukrainians uh, and what have you, but also to, to Londoners. Um, Yemen, yes, has completely fallen off the news agenda. And uh, I'm sorry to see that. It's something we've regularly campaigned to highlight what's happening. The bombing by the Saudis is continuing to this day uh, and, and it needs to be highlighted. Um, the, the, uh, the Yemenis have been under, uh, under the threat of being kicked into the Stone Age by the Saudis, and it has to be said by support from both the British and US military on this front. Uh, it's a real disgrace and we need to 
make sure that the world doesn't forget them whilst the emphasis and focus becomes the Ukraine. And I'm glad we've got a platform here to say that and highlight that uh, through questions um, raised by other progressive internationalists in the labour movement. Thank you, Mia, for those two answers. Um, our next speaker is from Stand Up to Racism, um, and we'll be covering a, an important point point of the title of this session, which is Refugees Welcome Here, um, two weeks before the very important UN Anti-Racism Day demonstration in London. I'm pleased to welcome Sabi Dali. Thank you very much, Matt, and um, thank you to everyone for joining this very important panel today. So um, firstly, I want to say how absolutely outrageous it is that the government has not announced a proper refugee scheme in response to the Ukraine crisis. I mean, what they have announced is an extended visa scheme to allow friends and family to join Ukrainian people who are actually British citizenship, who actually have British citizenship and are British citizens. And as you can imagine, that is absolutely woefully inadequate. There's got to be a proper refugee scheme to allow Ukrainians fleeing the war and others fleeing war to, uh, to be allowed to seek asylum in Britain. And once again, Britain is failing in its international duty to provide proper protection and uh, provide a sanctuary for asylum seekers. They failed in Afghanistan. They failed in response to the Syria war and the refugee crisis emerging from that. And they're once again failing in the Ukraine war. So we have to fight for refugee rights and for people to be allowed to seek asylum here and a proper refugee scheme in response to that. Secondly, the war on Ukraine has revealed deep rooted racism in Europe with um, two things. Firstly, Black, um, African and Asian people who are trying to flee Ukraine have been met with racism um, at the Ukraine border. So Ukrainian officials have actually prioritised white Ukrainians trying to flee the country, but um, you know, telling African and Asian people that they've got to walk and they're not allowed to board trains. Some African and Asian people, as they're queuing up and waiting, have been violently um, attacked in racist attacks as white people try and prioritise themselves um, fleeing the war is absolutely disgusting racism. And I think Britain and the whole international community has got to stand up to this. Um, this is you know, absolutely outrageous. And a lot of people that are uh, of African or Asian origin in Ukraine are actually either migrant workers or students and they just want safe passage to be allowed to go back home they don't even want to seek asylum necessarily most of them just want safe passage to go home so it's really ridiculous that you know Europe and Britain you know stops you know African Arab Asian you know people trying to come into Europe and Britain and then when they want to go back home they're met with racism and prevented from going back home Many of them are described in you know, a very desperate situation. So we have to stand up to this uh, and we have to fight for um, refugee rights. I think our message is clear. I think we have to say no to racism, safe passage for all, refugees welcome, wave visas, not flags. And when it comes to specifically British um, policy, so I think Britain is um, implementing measures, the British government is implementing measures that Enoch Powell would be proud of. And one of these measures is the Nationality and Borders Bill, which includes things like Clause 9, which would give the government the power to remove the citizenship of people whose parents were not born in Britain on very spurious grounds. So we can see how dangerous that is and how racist that is. And as many have pointed out, that is likely to lead to another Windrush scandal with people being wrongfully deported from Britain and wrongfully denied their citizenship status without any notice. And it's a huge victory that the Lords actually voted this week to remove that clause from the legislation. Another part of the bill, you know, essentially 
fundamentally deny all but you know denies the fundamental right to seek asylum in Britain it it criminalizes asylum seekers and makes it more likely that people will drown um in the sea we've seen you know many you know absolutely you know government um you know made tragedies of people drowning in the sea as they're trying to flee to safety and reach Britain and it's so tragic because so few people actually you know try to come to Britain try to cross the tra channel that we can't allow them you know safe passage and um, allow them to seek asylum here it's not illegal they've got a right to do that is absolutely grotesque and it's racist um, and so I think we cannot be complacent we have got to fight uh, for this bill to be scrapped and we have to um, say refugees welcome here. Now, I was proud the day that Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party, I was proud to stand next to him um, at the major refugees welcome demo. There was over 100,000 people there in response to the refugee crisis. Um, and, you know, it was a, an amazing day. Well, it's time to take to the streets again. We've got to say no to racism, safe passage for all, refugees welcome. Join us at the March Against Racism on the 19th of March in London um, and also 19th of March in Glasgow. And there's one in Cardiff on the 20th of March. So uh, wherever you are in the country, please join those demonstrations. Uh, we have to take to the streets to fight racism and fight for refugee rights. Um, thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you on the streets on the 19th. Thank you. Thank you, Sabi, for that very important um, contribution. And I remember Tony Benn used to say that you could judge a government by how it treated refugees. And I think we can tell a lot about this government from that. Um, if Mirad Sabi and Sophie could hang on in case we have time for some more questions at the end of the session, that would be appreciated. Um, and if people can donate, at the link provided, please do so, it's very important. Um, I can see our next speaker has now joined us. I think perhaps between different speaking and activist engagements and constituency engagements, as always, he's kindly joined us here online. Um, it's an absolute privilege, as always, to introduce my dear friend and comrade, uh, founder of the Peace and Justice Project, long term supporter of all the campaigns at CMD and Stop the War we're here supporting today. Welcome, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Matt. Um, thanks very much. I'm sorry to be speaking to you from a car in central London, as they say, but it's been quite a busy day, but this is only my third engagement. Um, first of all, I absolutely endorse everything Savvy just said, and uh, the demonstration on the 19th of March is very, very important because the issues of racism um, towards refugees and asylum seekers and treatment of people is absolutely central to everything that we have to do and when i hear the language used in parliament about people fleeing from france to get into britain across the channel risking everything in order to get to a place of safety then surely people only do that if they're very very desperate the language has changed a bit in the past week because of the terrible war in the ukraine and there is now um, very wide demand that all ukrainian refugees should be given a place of safety in whichever country they get to one that i absolutely support and endorse and i hope the british government um, does allow um, ukrainian refugees access to this country i would also say that there are other victims of war other victims of occupations around the world who also deserve a place of safety so if we are giving safety to ukrainian refugees which i think we should absolutely should then we should also give a place of safety to refugees from the war in yemen or any of the other conflicts around the world we cannot be anything other than even-handed about this Tomorrow, there's going to be a big demonstrations all around the world against the uh, war in the Ukraine. And I'll be at the one tomorrow and speaking in Trafalgar Square against this war. There can be no justification whatsoever for the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the bombing of civilian targets and the killing of a large number of civilians as well as army personnel. 
the deaths of people in Ukraine, the deaths of soldiers um, fighting for Ukraine, the deaths of Russian soldiers who've been conscripted and sent to Ukraine has to be condemned equally and unequivocally. And that we all have to do. We also have to recognize the wonderful work being done by many opponents of this war in Russia. I had a very long conversation with some young people in Moscow a couple of days ago, and they were telling me how difficult it was to campaign against the war, how difficult it was to cut past the nationalist rhetoric and say, well, actually, this war is wrong and unnecessary. And so we have to support them in the huge risks they're taking. And I draw attention to the uh, socialist against the war statement that many people in Russia have supported and sent out. And we have to, in turn, support them in that and make sure that um, there is an urgent ceasefire. And I'd say this, if they can do a ceasefire for two cities, then you can do a ceasefire for the whole war. There's no difficulty in that. Have a ceasefire come to some agreement, but above all, stop the killing. Stop the killing as quickly as you can and look to a longer term and wider peace that respects people's identity and the country in which they live. Because this is a world where, sadly, the issues that face the planet, the health inequalities, which COVID demonstrated, environmental destruction, which should have been addressed at COP26, but wasn't, which ended, ended up with a lot of greenwash, but a lot of very good work being done by environmental campaigners. Those are the issues that face this world, as does global poverty and inequality brought about by a free market economic system. So our movement should not be going in the direction of um, free market economics and business as usual for the economists of the world. We should instead be talking about equality, about social justice, about investment in people's needs, about universal basic incomes and all, all those issues and ideas, because that has to be the way forward, not one of exacerbating or perpetuating global inequality. Wars are driven by many things. They're driven by nationalist rhetoric. They're driven by um, leaders who uh, owe a great deal to the very wealthy in the case of Putin and his robber baron mates that um, are so dominant in Russia. Um, but they're also driven by the desire of the arms industry to sell more and more arms all around the world. And that is the, uh, one of the great dangers of the present time. And every weapon that we sell to Saudi Arabia that's used to bomb Yemen and destroy schools and hospitals and houses and kill people is a product of British industry and what Britain is doing. So we need to have a determination to be a more peaceful world. And that means stopping the reliance on the arms industry and the arms trade and a serious well thought out trade union based campaign of arms conversion, because if we don't do that, then we're going to end up more and more relying on the war economy anywhere around the world. The nuclear non-proliferation treaty review is coming up. The global band uh, conference is coming up also. It's high time that we recognize just how evil and dangerous nuclear weapons are that, uh, if anyone fires a nuclear weapon off anywhere, that will set off a chain reaction, which will be almost unstoppable. And the damage and killing will be massive. There has to be an understanding, particularly with generations that have not been exposed to anti-nuclear campaigning, just how evil nuclear weapons are. And so I'll be supporting uh, CND, and indeed I will be, um, going to the Global Bank Conference in Vienna when it finally takes place later, um, later this year in, in the midsummer period. But then people say, okay, well, that's all very well. Where's there any hope in the world? I'll say there's masses of hope in the world. There's hope in every community, in every street where people campaign for better, better life and social justice. There's hope where people stand up against human rights abuses and injustice. There's hope where people look for peace, not war. And there's hope where people achieve great things for global inequality. And uh, next uh, Friday, the 11th of March, um, 
Gabriel Boric is going to be inaugurated as president of Chile. Now, I think that is going to be a remarkable occasion. Think back of the history of Chile, the election of Salvador Allende in 1970, the coup in 1973, the end of Pinochet in 1990, but not the end of the Pinochet system, not the end of the uh, impunity of the armed forces and, of course, of Pinochet himself. And then there's been huge ructions in Chile over economic injustice, poverty and inequality. And that finally resulted in the election of Gabriel Boric as president and a national conversation about a new, a new constitution which enshrines the right to health, to education, to housing, to work, to a decent, clean environment. That mirrored by what's been achieved in Bolivia, mirrored by what's been achieved in Honduras and the general march of the left all across uh, Latin America. That's what gives me some hope and some inspiration. And so... We have great battles on, great battles for social justice and decent pay and wages and conditions here in our own country, but we also have the importance of international solidarity to bring about peace and justice all over the world. That's what unites us, that's what brings us together. And Matt, thank you so much for today's event and all the other events that we do, because when we come together like this, albeit still on Zoom and so on, we do have a better understanding of each other's perceptions of these struggles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you to all our speakers. Please do um, get involved with the different campaigns we've heard from in this session, including Stand Up to Racism, CND and the Stop the War Coalition, and of course, Jeremy's PPJ. Um, I've got some questions in from different people. We've got a little bit of time. Um, I've got a specific one from Sabi from Rafi on Zoom, who asks, how can we harness the massive empathy which the British public have shown to the plight of Ukrainian refugees and extend it to refugees and migrants from Iraq, Afghanistan and other Asian, African and Middle Eastern countries? Um, and then I also have a question here, which if Jeremy can hang on for, I think it would be a good one from him, which is from a disillusioned young Labour activist um, who asks, do you think a peaceful and socialist future can still happen? How can we keep hope for a better world? And um, so I'll go to Jeremy first for that one and then to Sabi. Um, thanks for the question. If you think of the idea and the principle and the the inspiration of what socialism is, a society based on recognizing the needs of everyone and leaving no one behind and making sure our public services are there for all and make sure that um, real security, that is health, housing, food, is there for all. Socialism is actually the socialism of many people's everyday life. Yes, there are attacks on, on it. There are attacks on individuals who are prominent socialists from those that fear equality because they want to protect their massive inequality of wealth and wealth distribution. That's why Bernie Sanders has been so vilified in the USA. That's why indigenous leaders in so many countries are vilified because of their inspiration. But socialism is about people thinking rationally and sensibly about how we can deal with the issues that face the world. There is clearly an environmental disaster happening before our very eyes. It is pollution of the air, of the water. It is of global warming. It is about the destruction of the diversity of our natural world and our environment. Can a free enterprise system solve that? Obviously not because of free enterprise market economies, whole rationale is the continued exploitation of the natural resources of the world, the continued increase in the burning of fossil fuels, and the continued damage to the environment. A socialist view would be, you produce what you need for a sustainable living. But unless we change our economic system and thinking into supporting people to maintain a decent and reasonable standard of living, then we're not going to be able to change the whole chapter on environmental destruction. And so, as many said at the alternative COP26 in Glasgow, there, there's no chance of stopping climate change unless we also have system change. And so it is about social justice and equality and sustainable living. 
if you produce something for obsolescence, rapid obsolescence, then you're using up energy you need not have used. You're wasting natural raw materials, which you need not have wasted. If you're producing for need, not profit, then it all becomes much more doable and much more sustainable. I've just been to a very interesting meeting of the um, left in Southwark. Very interesting discussion about environment in an urban area. What you do about air pollution housing and all those things. So socialism is about working with people and inspiring people in our own communities, in our day-to-day -day struggles, as well as the huge issues of standing in solidarity with people when something so horrendous and awful happens, as has happened with uh, Russia invading Ukraine, as has happened with the bombing of Yemen, what's happened with the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so we campaign on many fronts, but fundamentally, it's one front, socialism and social justice. Thank you, Jeremy. And I think that's ending right. That's what we're all about here today. Um, we're not going to stop talking about socialism and socialist change. Um, over a thousand people on this call right now from all across the country. And also I'm pleased to say people from Australia watching from their young labour, which I think is about half two in the morning there, or maybe even three in the morning. So that's quite remarkable. And also some people watching from California have joined us, which is great. And um, I've already passed one question on to Sabi, and we've got a second one here for Sabi as well. I think you'll be able to answer them together. And this one goes, do you think Labour should back an open door policy for Ukrainian refugees? Um, and then the second half is similar to the one we've already received. The second half of this one says, how can we make people more sympathetic to all refugees fleeing conflict, human rights abuses? Um, before we hear from Sabi, I would please encourage people to donate £20 or what you can on the links provided. It is very important for us to be able to keep hosting these events that we do get the donations we can. Um, over to you, Sabi. Thanks very much, Matt. And thanks for those um, excellent questions. So I think on the um, first question, I mean, I think um, the, the the Ukraine war has revealed a lot of racism. Um, so in my speech, I mentioned the racism towards African and Asian people that are trying to flee Ukraine to safety. But another element of racism has been the media coverage. I mean, I, I, not a lot of things shock me, but I have been shocked by the way you know media you know in the in Europe in Britain and in the US have used language like um, um, you know civilized Europe you know war in civilized Europe you know white blonde um, blue-eyed uh, people becoming refugees and having to flee to safety as though if you're you know black or if you're Arab or African you know being a refugee is okay and normal so I think that part of the solution to trying to you know get some more empathy for you know Syrian refugees or Afghan refugees um, or any other uh, African refugees any other refugee to get it to the same level as, as it has been towards, you know, Ukrainians um, trying to, um, you know, flee to safety. I think it's it's fighting racism is part of that uh, because I think it does make a difference. I think people are more sympathetic, unfortunately, to white people um, seeking safety um, than uh, European people seeking safety than African, Arab or Asian people. So fighting racism and campaigning against it is an important part of that, which is why, you know, our campaign is so important because we say, you know, refugee rights for all, all refugees should be welcome. And, um, um, you know, we have to respect, you know, everyone's right, regardless of your background. And it is very sad because it wasn't so long ago, actually, that there were white refugees um, fleeing um, their country and trying to seek safety, safety and were refugees. It wasn't that long ago, you know, during the Second World War and the Nazi Holocaust that Jewish people had to um, flee their homeland. So it's sad that, you know, only, you know, such as a, a short time, um, it's only, what, um, 70 plus years since the Second World War, um, and, you know, people seem to have, you know, forgotten that. Well, you know, the whole world said never again and never again means we have to um, respect everyone's refugee and asylum rights. Now, 
In terms of um, the second question, what policy should the government adopt and should it be an open door policy? I mean, I think, I think first of all, we need to, the government needs, you know, a, a radical sort of sea change in its whole approach because its whole approach at the moment is we can't let anyone in, you know, just the, the whole approach is, you know, letting in people is a problem and we have to, you know, stop um, um, stop people coming in and, we, and reduce the amount of people coming in to a bare minimum. Well, that's not going to work during a war. So I think the first step would be just accepting that we have to allow Ukrainian refugees to come into the country. And of course, there should be international cooperation and coordination between, you know, between the different you know countries of the EU and uh, and with the US and obviously it does make it more difficult now that Britain is not in the EU but still there's no harm you know in cooperating and um, coordinating on that so I think you know the the fundamental thing is we have to um, allow people to seek refuge here and we have to fight for that and defend people's right to do that. Thank you, Sabi. I'm going to quickly, before we end, I'm going to quickly go to Murad and Sophie to see if they have any like last 30 seconds sum up. Before that, I'm just going to make a few announcements and say a few things myself. Um, first of all, thank you to everyone for participating, including Jeremy from his car. And um, as I have said before, please do donate if you can. Without your donations, we can't go on having these great events. Um, I think we all know from the different people we've heard from here how important campaigning ahead is and we have to keep prioritising campaigning for people, health and planet and peace to be put before private profit. I think events like today, these more in-depth discussions give us a chance to look and understand a bit more about building that solidarity. Um, and as our speakers have said, in terms of the current situation, we must keep building voices for peace, including by explaining that a no-fly no zone in Ukraine could be a pathway to war between nuclear powers which should oppose nuclear weapons and say refugees are welcome here. And there should be no restrictions on those refugees forced to leave Ukraine from here. Um, no conditions should be applied. Solidarity too, as Jeremy and others mentioned, with those protesters in Russia and throughout the world who stand for peace. And with those building socialist political currents all around the world for a better future. Um, as Chris Hazard MP said this week, what is needed is a comprehensive and sustainable ceasefire, the withdrawal of Russian troops and return to the negotiations table. Along those lines, please do get involved with the campaigns and the vital issues we've raised in this session. And also, please do follow Labour Outlet. And um, please do stay online after our 30 second sum ups from Murad and then Sophie as a free 30 company. We have our International Women's Day rally. Um, and if you're on webinar or YouTube, you can stay on the same links. So go to Murad first very quickly and then Sophie. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, I just want to reinforce uh, tomorrow's. Um, peace demonstrations throughout the country and globally. Uh, and I trust and I'm I am sure that many will be joining them. Uh, I think it's very, very important that we show and uh, that we're saying peace to uh, the Ukraine and no to the uh, invasion by the Putin regime. Um, I've been struck by how the um, spontaneously the uh, stop the war name has come up actually in, in, in the Ukraine and Russia. It's a generic uh, instinct that I think a lot of people understand. And um, I think the brave souls in uh, the Ukraine and uh, Russia who are uh, st standing on, on, on that uh, platform should be given our full solidarity and tomorrow's that occasion. Thank you, Mirad. And final word to Sophie from CND for this session. But as I said, please do stay online for the Hubbard's free one as well. Thank you. Um, I mean, just to say, I've put some um, a link into the chat um, for like more information about the sort of human catastrophe of um, nuclear war. So please, you know, look at that. Um, but also, I just wanted to say that you know, public opinion is on our side. Um, the media, you know, would not. You know, you'd not know that from the media, but but it is, you know, there is a majority that is against an escalation to this to this war and against uh, military intervention, which I think is really interesting is that actually the majority of that support, like over 70 percent of that support is amongst much older populations. And I think that is because they've lived through the very real fear of a potential um, nuclear war. Um, so, you know, we we do represent, you know, the whole of humanity here 
fighting for peace. There is no alternative. War is not the answer. We've got to continue fighting. We've got to make sure that we, we bring all the parties to the negotiation table to stop this and to save lives. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sophie. Um... Please now, we've got a 10 minute break, maybe have a cup of tea or something a bit stronger if that's to your liking. And we've got a number of international guests joining us for this excellent women's rally to close the day in 10 minutes. Um, see you then and thank you to all our speakers.
Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to our speakers who are coming online for the closing rally now. Um, if you could rename yourself so we know who everyone is as they come in. Um, and we're due to start in three minutes time. Um, if you're in the audience, you can just stay on the YouTube and the webinar link. You don't need to um, you don't need to go anywhere and um, the social media streams will start again at half past. So we're just starting in two minutes. Thank you. Everyone. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Gemma Bolton. Uh, I'm a CLP representative on Labour's National Executive Committee. And it's an absolute honour to chair this Women for Peace, Global Justice and Social Change closing rally, which ends today's Making Another World Possible an International Agenda for the Left and Labour event. And uh, it's been attended by thousands of you online throughout the day. It's in the context of the increasingly dangerous times that we live in. This event has been a key point to organise for an international agenda for justice and equality. And as we approach International Women's Day 2022, socialist women all around the world are at the forefront of resistance to inequality and injustice, fighting for progressive solutions to the health, environmental and other crises people face. And in this fight for a better world, we need to raise and amplify our voices collectively in solidarity building links and solidarity internationally. And that's why I'm so delighted to welcome such an amazing closing panel for today. Please also donate anything you can at the link provided so Arise can continue hosting these really important events and support the other campaigns and links put in the chat throughout the event. So without further ado, I'll move on to our first speaker. And our first speaker is Bia Raton, who uh, is from the Brazilian Workers' Party activist based in London, who will update us on one of the most important struggles women um, are leading in the world, and that's against the far right in Brazil and for the hopeful return of Lula as president. And we stand with you and your campaigning, Bia. Welcome. Hi, Gemma. Thanks so much. So I'll just uh, get started right away. So I just want to say good afternoon to everyone. And thank you to the Brazil Solidarity Initiative for inviting me and for my fellow panellists for being here today. So coming up to International Women's Day, I think it's important to re-emphasize the role and contribution of women to the creation of a new world order with peace, global justice and socialism at the center. So global estimates published by the WHO show that approximately one in three women worldwide have suffered physical and or sexual violence by a partner or third parties during their lifetime. This number translates to about 736 million and has remained largely unchanged over the past decade. The WHO warns that this violence starts early. One in four young women ages 15 to 24 who have been in a relationship will have experienced violence from their partners by their early 20s. 
As a Brazilian, I've seen many examples of violence, repression and misogyny in the public sphere in my country of birth. And our politics has a significant influence on the extent to which these behaviours are tackled. As is the case in many countries around the world, our nation has a complicated history when it comes to women's rights. But in the last 20 years, there have been some important landmarks under left-wing governments. So in 2006, the Maria da Penha law was passed, which seeks to protect women from domestic violence. The number of deaths per 100,000 women decreased from 4.2 to 3.9 between 2006 and 2007. We also had the 2015 feminicide law, which brought re legal recognition of feminicide in Brazil via our first female president, Dilma Rousseff. The law recognized feminicidio as legally different from homicide and crimes ju judged as feminicides carry sentences between a third to a half longer. But the architect of the 2015 feminicide law was soon subject to a coup and removed from power. And the move to depose Dilma Rousseff was not only a political action, but a sexist one. Dilma was referred to as crazy, unbalanced, and by all the other tired sexist tropes heard around the world when referring to women in power. On top of this, there was a popularization of violent and obscene images, for example, car stickers that went over fuel tank openings of, and this is a trigger warning, the former president with her legs open where the gas is inserted. In this context, it's no surprise then that the subsequent governments dominated by right-wing politicians and conservatives have reversed previous progress being made. Elected in 2018, current President Jair Bolsonaro's far-right government has been the worst Brazil has experienced since becoming a democracy for a host of reasons. Notably, it has seen a wide scale of rollback of women's rights and a discourse of anti-feminism and misogyny. Before he became president, Bolsonaro himself had previously said of a congresswoman that she was not worth raping as she was too ugly. Before the pandemic, one of the biggest blows to women in Brazil was the appointment of Pastor Damaris Alves. One of only two women in his government, she is the Minister of Women, Family and Human Rights in Brazil, which replaced the Ministry of Human Rights under Bolsonaro's leadership. Yet Damaris defends the prohibition of abortion after rape and in risky pregnancies. Her focus instead is on the role of the woman in the home and in traditional gender roles. Against this backdrop, building for years in public discourse before Bolsonaro even swept to power, these aggressive comments from public figures, pundits and leaders created an environment where violence against women was able to spread like a cancer. Even before the pandemic, in 2019, data showed that 1,326 feminicides were recorded in Brazil, which was an increase of 7.1% compared to 2018, and rape occurred every eight minutes. This violence is also racialized and reflects the need for a fiercely intersectional approach to feminist responses to violence, as the racist nature of the state makes the lot of black women who make up 66.6% .6 of feminicide victims particularly stark. And so the language of violence against women endorsed in the halls of power echoes into the home. Women are almost three times as likely to be murdered in their own residence than men, according to evidence from the UN. The nature of the pandemic means these figures are likely to have drastically worsened as women were trapped in the home with their abusers. 4.3 million Brazilian women were physically assaulted with slaps, punches or kicks during the pandemic. This means that every minute, eight women were beaten in Brazil. And unlike with COVID, there is no vaccine for violence against women and girls, and the risk to life and health continues. But there is hope for change at the highest level. Bolsonaro's record in government suggests that if there are free and fair elections, former President Lula is likely to win the presidency in 2022. And he's polling as high as 20, 42%, sorry. It was in his first term that the Marinha da Penha domestic violence law was passed. And he also focuses on the rights of minorities, women, poor, black, LGBTQ and indigenous peoples. While Lula does remain the favorite, it's extremely important for Brazil that he wins the next election, so we can't relax. 
whatever happens with the presidency, the left, centre-left and progressives need to form a majority in Congress so they can play the leading role in the next government and effect real change again. This will directly impact the lives of women. Brazil needs to rebuild after Bolsonaro, not only to reverse the shocking trend of government enabling and condoning misogyny and violence against women, but also to save the environment, indigenous groups, women, LGBTQ, the poor, the black population and other minoritized groups. It's the kind of challenge that Lula has excelled at before and we hope against hope he'll do it again in 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Beer and Solidarity. Um, our second speaker is also on a vital struggle in the world for justice and human rights today, namely Tamara Ben-Halim, a Palestinian coordinator and co-director for MACAN. Let's all make sure that we all speak up for Palestine this International Women's Day. Welcome, Tamara. Thank you, Gemma, and uh, thank you, Arise, uh, for having me. It's uh, a pleasure to be here uh, amongst uh, this brilliant panel. Um, two weeks ago, a 14-year-old Palestinian child was shot and killed by Israeli soldiers who prevented ambulances from reaching him before he died. His name was Mohammed Shahadeh. Earlier this week, as Palestinians gathered for worship in Jerusalem's old city, an 11-year-old deaf Palestinian girl, Manwar Burqan, was critically injured by a stun grenade thrown in her face by Israeli soldiers. As we speak, Palestinians in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of Jerusalem continue to bravely stand up to the Israeli army and armed settlers colluding to forcibly remove them from their home, from their homes. What connects these events, which are reported on as seemingly isolated and disconnected from one another, if they're reported on at all? Well, since Israel's inception, the story we've been told is one of two equal sides fighting one another, of an inherently violent Arab people refusing to recognize a peaceful and civilized Israel. Of course, this narrative is the one that's been set by a colonizing power and peddled by imperial states around the world allied with it. But as with everything else, the truth eventually seeps out. The real story has been emerging, as we saw in the early summer of 2021, when Palestinians across historic Palestine rose up in support of their siblings in Sheikh Jarrah, who were defiantly protecting their homes from ethnic cleansing with nothing but their own bodies. When, during the holy month of Ramadan, Palestinians came together to break their fasts in community on the streets of their homes and their land as far-right Israelis marched through Jerusalem, chanting slogans of death to Arabs. These scenes were difficult to ignore or distort, not that the mainstream media didn't try its best, attempting to describe the events as clashes between two sides. But, for the first time, people around the world were openly calling out this framing. The terms ethnic cleansing and settler colonialism started to appear across social media, the epitome of this narrative shift being the famous moment where Mohammed Al-Kurd, a resident of Sheikh Jarrah, refusing to accept CNN's framing of the attempted removal of his family as eviction on a live interview and asserting that this was forced ethnic displacement to an international audience. What Mohammed and others were powerfully stating is what Palestinians have been saying for the past 70 years that our story is one of an indigenous people who were there before the creation of the Israeli state and who are being brutalized by a settler colonial regime trying to dominate and replace us with Jewish Israeli settlers, all in order to take full control of the land of historic Palestine from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. It's a story of one of the most powerful military states in the world, subjugating a stateless occupied people and punishing them for daring to struggle for their freedom. Once understood through this prism, Israel's seemingly senseless killing of innocent children, its imprisonment of civilians, and its violent land theft all start to make sense. And yet, thanks to a powerful propaganda machine and to the complicity of powerful allies of whom Britain is at the forefront, this historic and present reality is at best little known and at worst deliberately ignored. The most powerful tool in its arsenal that Israel has deployed against us is this attempt to erase. Erase our culture, our identity, our roots, our food, our stories, and our humanity. But here we are in 2022, 
over a century since the beginning of this attempted erasure initiated by Britain in its signing of the Balfour Declaration. And Palestinians have not forgotten, nor have we stopped struggling for our freedom. And the world is finally beginning to listen. From the reports of leading human rights organizations deeming Israel an apartheid state, to the growth of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement calling for an end of support for Israel until it abides by international law, to the global solidarity Palestinians have been witnessing over recent years from civil society, global anti-racist movements like Black Lives Matter, and from labor members, unions, and social justice activists here in Britain, the tide is turning. Of course, our work is far from done. Courageous people in this country who are speaking up in support of Palestine, including many people here today, are being attacked and smeared. Academics threatened with removal, university and, and school students racially profiled by the government's prevent agenda, and labor members thrown out of their party for standing in solidarity with Palestine. It's easy to lose hope in these moments, but it's in those very moments that we have to remember that the attempts to quash our activism actually reflect the success of our collective efforts so far. In fact, back in 2006, the Reut Institute, a Zionist Israeli think tank, released a paper that outlined a plan to address and attack hubs of Palestine solidarity around the world in an effort to quash the global movement for Palestine. And at the top of that list was London. This tells us something very significant, that the organizing and activism in Britain, across Europe, the United States, and elsewhere, is actually a great threat to the Israeli state, a global nuclear and military power. It tells us that building grassroots solidarity across different lines is effective. Where we are ultimately most powerful is where we refuse to work in silos, where we build power through alliances and close collaboration, where we understand that the causes close to our hearts are deeply interconnected. So that if we're struggling for an anti-racist society here in Britain, we're also struggling to end racism around the world. And that includes ending the apartheid regime that subjugates Palestinians in the name of a Jewish state. If we're struggling for climate justice, that includes struggling for climate justice for indigenous people from Canada to Brazil, to Australia, to Palestine. What underpins all of these struggles is the value of anti-colonialism. A vision of a world free from injustice can only be materialized with an understanding of the root causes of this injustice. Once we understand this, it becomes clear that the British colonialism and racism that enabled the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in the first place is the same colonial racism that today places little or no importance on black and brown lives, that enables racial profiling in our streets, justifies the deaths of asylum seekers and immigrants attempting to reach our shores in safety, allows and encourages Islamophobia in our society, and insists that nationality and citizenship are privileges to be earned, not rights we possess. Struggling for justice in Palestine is inherently intertwined with struggling for justice in Britain and everywhere else. And keep it going and keep speaking up, we have to. So please keep using your voices and your words in the struggle for freedom for Palestinians and for all oppressed people everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, we're now going to um, have a quick word from Sean Errington from Arise about their work and how you can help. Thank you very much, Gemma, and thank you for everyone who has taken part today. It's been a really, really great afternoon with lots of discussion and lots of really brilliant speakers. Um, we've had over a thousand people um, join us at different points um, on the Zoom and across the different streams. And I think it just shows how there's a massive appetite still for um, coming together in these forums, discussing ideas, hearing from speakers that we might not have had a chance to hear from um, because actually being online and Zoom has really made that possible. Um, so I'm also going to, the main point of my intervention is really to encourage you to keep such things going and happening. Um, things like this online uh, event today, don't happen by accident, they happen because of the dedication and time of a group of volunteers. And things like Zoom and mailing lists and other things actually aren't free. Um, they take up quite a lot of money. So I would really ask you to donate what you can um, 
the pandemic and the last 10 years have been very difficult for a lot of people. So if you can only donate a little bit, that would be great. For those of you that have come through um, uh, with a bit more to spare, if you could spare 10 or 20 pounds, that would be really, really appreciated because it also we want to keep these things free and to keep doing them as much as possible. Um, our next event that Arise is supporting is the Workers Can't Wait event on March 16th and that's going to be with Don McDonnell and throughout the year we'll carry on having like brilliant events at different points so please 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 donate so we can keep having them thank you very much thanks John uh, now it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Christine Blower who's a Labour member of the House of Lords an officer of the Socialist Campaign Group and one of Arise's most important and consistent speakers so welcome Christine Gemma uh, thank you very much indeed and it's a it's a, it's a real pleasure to follow Sean and just to remind ourselves how much fantastic work Arise has been doing. So, comrades, sisters, solidarity greetings to you all at this women's rally. And let me add in solidarity greetings from two other uh, Socialist Campaign Group members of the House of Lords, Shami Chakrabarti and Pauline Bryan, without whose presence in the House of Lords, it would be a much duller and less socialist place. Uh, and let's acknowledge today that uh, March the 5th was the birthday of Rosa Luxemburg, 151 years ago today. And also, according to my uh, radical diary, March the 8th, uh, uh, which became International Women's Day, was co-founded by Clara Ze uh, Zekin, a, a, a German Marxist. Um, and one of the things that she said was this. What made women's labor particularly attractive to the capitalists was not only its lower price, but also the greater submissiveness of women. Now, I think everybody on this call knows that there is still an enormous struggle on for, uh, for women's work to be paid at an appropriate level. There's no way that we have uh, equality in pay, but I would like to think that on the submissiveness front, we've made enormous strengths since Clara died in 1933. And certainly from the women you heard who spoke before I did, you will see how determined and non-submissive they absolutely are. But whether we look domestically or internationally, we can see that there's a great deal to do for women's equality. So let's draw strength from the, from the fights and from the successes that have taken place internationally. And I have to say, despite the Turkish government and the fact that it's withdrawn from the Istanbul Agreement, um, the women's movement is alive and well in, in amongst Turkish and Kurdish women in Turkey. Uh, and although they face femicide of the same sort of order that we heard from the Brazilian sister, they continue to fight for political space, for social justice, and of course, for equality. But let's also look back at some of the women from whom we've drawn strength and inspiration uh, in our own history here in the UK. I was greatly inspired by the women who, having never before campaigned, became active, um, became politicized activists through the miners' strike. They came, uh, as they often said, out of the kitchen and onto the streets, and they were, in many cases, the face of that miners' strike and worked so hard at it. And it was indeed through struggle that they became politicized. And in terms of women for peace, and one of the issues about our rally today is about peace. Let's think back to those women of Greenham Common. In 1981, a group of women calling themselves Women for Life on Earth arrived at Greenham Common in Berkshire and they delivered a letter to the base commander asking for a debate about the cruise missiles that they thought were unreasonable anywhere and completely, utterly unreasonable being placed in the middle of Berkshire. And the debate, of course, having been refused, they set up the peace camp outside the fence. A lived example, I might say, of a recommendation by Shirley Chisholm, an American Democrat, the first black woman candidate for the presidency of the United States, who said rather famously, and I love this quotation, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Well, the Green and women had folding chairs aplenty and they had the courage and the determination, frankly, to inspire us all. And of course, 
They were successful through non-violent direct action, although many of them faced arrest and court action and were imprisoned. And of course, in the face of the kinds of legislation that's going through in Britain at the moment, we must continue to be on the streets in numbers to, pro to protest, to make sure that our right of protest remains. Protest in a democratic society is absolutely critical. And the thing about the Greenham women is that long before social media, they were able to capture the headlines and the attention of journalists and, and many, many women, I'm sure, I hope many on this call actually did go down and visit the camp. I myself did on a number of occasions to provide support and solidarity. And as we speak today, the world is watching the war on Ukraine. Since the end of World War II, the world has pretty much never been totally at peace. Many countries have faced both civil and international wars. And as women and as socialists, we must seek to engage in all the ways that we can in de-escalation and in peace building and in the sustainable future for all of us. I'm associated with an organization called the Movement for the Abolition of War. And one of the, uh, one of the things that we produced, one of the resources that we produced some while ago was actually to link conflict and climate change. It's a very good resource. Regressively, it's still as much needed as ever. So to do all of this, to do the peace building and the justice uh, seeking and the striving for equality, we know that women and girls have to be educated and afforded opportunity to engage in political debate and in activism. Looking at some of the younger women coming forward through the labor and trade union movement, I feel inspired by their examples. We have some brilliant women in the socialist campaign group. Of course, we have Diane Abbott, but we have uh, a, a number of young women of color who have come in and who are really taking the fight to the Tories on the political front. I'm definitely inspired by them. There was always, a, but there's always a really long struggle ahead for women. Uh, the TUC started producing material that, called, that's, that were called a step towards change very many years ago. Then they stopped calling it a step towards change because frankly, it's just a mile towards any kind of beginning of change. Uh, but the fact is that we do need to continue to wage, uh, to wage that struggle for peace, for social justice and for equality. But from the quality of what we see from women who are engaging in the political struggle, whether it's extra, whether it's parliamentary, extra parliamentary, whether it's here, whether it's globally, whether it's internationally, I believe, sisters, that we are up for the fight and ultimately we will win solidarity. Thanks, Christine. That was brilliant. We're going to uh, continue our attention to the struggle against the Tories and their reactionary policies uh, in this country. And we're going to hear from the brilliant Holly Turner from NHS Workers Say No. So welcome, Holly. Hi, thank you. Um, I'll start by just apologising. My children are playing dinosaurs in the next room and it's really loud. So <laughs> some really loud interruption. I'm sorry. Um, it was really great just hearing Christine talk about Greenham Common then. Um, my mum spent the first few years of my life at Greenham Common. And I think the only time me and my sister visited was when my dad took us down because we had to pick her up from um, court for chopping down a fence. So it was great to hear Christine talking about that. Um, so as introduced, I'm an NHS nurse and founder of the campaign group NHS Workers Say No. And as we approach International Women's Day, I want to discuss and highlight that 80% of the NHS workforce are women, yet we hold fewer than 50% of any senior roles across the NHS. With many of us struggling to balance work against home life whilst campaigning for equality of pay and opportunity, and coping with challenges such as sex stereotypes, sexual harassment, and lack of flexible working opportunities. I think the caring stereotype is often used against us and used as an excuse to pay us poorly, despite being a skilled professional workforce. Now for us workers, campaigners in the NHS, our fight continues following a decade of cuts to our pay, which have left us in a really dangerous situation 
Now, the government have recommended a 3% pay award for us this year, which yet again is nowhere near inflation and rep represents yet another cut to our workers' pay. You know, we've got millions on waiting lists. We've got 100,000 vacancies. We can't recruit or retain staff. And the government's refusal to pay any of us properly is just driving our workers further into poverty. It's only accelerating the rate at which staff are leaving. And this is a political choice, as we know. Now, come April, our band two colleagues will be earning below a real living wage, which is just grossly unfair and completely unacceptable. Now, health workers, of course, do the job because they care, but that doesn't mean that we have to accept unsafe working conditions and annual cuts to our pay. Now, by the government not addressing the core issues of inadequate funding, privatisation, outsourcing, not paying us properly, the door is just left wide open for further privatisation, which is going to impact our whole society at a time when we know private healthcare is just completely unaffordable and out of the question for most. Now, health and peace are interrelated. It is said that there can't be health without peace and obviously there can't be peace then without health. Now, conflict and violence do affect both physical and mental health and they're, they're internationally really damaging to our health systems. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has strained our already fragmented health systems, but really we should be using this as an opportunity to build, promote and sustain peace in these conflict affected countries. We know that we're at a time when violent conflict internationally has spiked and increased in complexity. Other global issues such as climate change, rise in equality will only exacerbate fragility in healthcare systems. Given the global status of conflict and that most of the world's extreme poor are predicted to live in fragile conflict affected areas by 2030, it's never been more critical and necessary to be asking questions around how health can directly and indirectly promote peace. We know our healthcare workers are the beating heart of the health system and the majority as shared before are women. Global demand for health workers is rising changing demographics and expanding health systems are driving the need for more health and social care workers than ever. We desperately need a fit and robust workforce, yet the global mismatch between supply and demand of health workers is a cause for very deep concern. Globally, healthcare workers are organising and screaming out that our situation is unsustainable. We've seen health healthcare workers in recent months on strike in New Zealand, Australia, Berlin, Sri Lanka, America and Poland, amongst many, many more countries. As a campaign group, we've been building global glass, grassroots solidarity with our international striking colleagues and parallels can be drawn across our struggles. High risk working environments, insufficient PPE, recruitment challenges. Put simply, staff are overworked and patient care is often described as poor due to staff shortages. Yet I will end by talking about that we are seeing some wins. Only yesterday we learned that a campaign for 1,800 outsourced staff at Barts in London are going to be brought back in-house following strike action. These sorts of wins build confidence in other NHS workers and really, really do inspire to keep building and organising. So please, everyone, if you see a, low camp a local campaign like this, join us on our pickets and show solidarity. It really is appreciated. If we're going to bring about change and safeguard the future of our health services, we need to be focusing on these local wins, as well as working collectively to see big shifts in national and international bargaining. So thank you, everyone, and solidarity. Thanks, Holly, and congratulations on an amazing win at Barts. Uh, our next speaker is uh, someone familiar to many of us as a real fighter. It's the Magnus, uh, Chris Pierce from the Augury Truth and Justice campaign. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. And it's a real honour to be on this platform. Thank you to Arise for inviting us. And whilst I'm here speaking in the true spirit of trade union collectivism, what I'm going to say um, is a joint um, contribution from myself and my comrade sister, our secretary, of the All Grief, Truth and Justice campaign, Kate Flannery. Um, and we've got International Women's Day coming up next week. Uh, and I'm just going to say at the beginning, uh, just a quick reminder, uh, women aren't born uh, with a love of writing minutes. 
uh, an inherent urge to deal with admin and emails uh, and a pre-programmed knowledge of how Zoom works. We're activists and we're fighters through and through. Um, some of what I say uh, will be familiar to some of you, but sadly not to everybody, because I am going to touch on the miners' strike of 84, 85, uh, because little did we know then how the labour and trade union movement and our communities were going to experience the full force of the state and that women involved in that would emerge having played a powerful and essential role in protest and sustaining that strike, as Christine referred to. What happened then, I assure you, sisters, is not history. It is direct, directly relevant to the world we have today. The cruelty of the 80s statutory government aimed to destroy the most hardened sections of the British working class, create greater workplace management control and transform society into a neoliberal state. Success for the Tories meant punitive anti-trade union legislation involving severe restrictions on strikes and picketing, developing a militarised police force and creating criminals out of workers uh, fighting for justice and their jobs. Tory policy meant that there was conflict with workers and the trade union movement and their government would not confront them unprepared. The scene was all set to create the society we have today, unfortunately for us. The Tories used every means possible to ensure picketing would not be effective uh, for a long time. The role of women was crucial. In March 84, a number of women active in local politics and mining communities in Yorkshire organised support and solidarity for the miners, fully understanding the implications of the strike. The National Coal Board and the media tried to use the wives and partners and families of miners to support an anti-strike campaign and weaken industrial disputes. However, high unemployment benefits cuts, job threats to future generation meant many women were supportive of the strike. You may have taken on the miners, but when you took the women on, you had a fight on your hands. Those support groups were formed all across Britain. Women came from a variety of cultures, backgrounds, in addition to many miners, wives and partners. We saw local government workers, home workers, engineers, students, peace and anti-racist campaigners, all united in the desire to see a successful conclusion to the strike. The women fundraised, fed communities, went on pickets, marched, organised events, meetings and rallies and spoke in support of the strike. This was unprecedented for many of them. That movement encouraged women to put socialist feminist ideas into practice in an industrial dispute and it empowered them to take public and leading roles in a male dominated community. As the strike got longer and harder, um, the women's resolve became stronger, highlighting the importance of women in the industrial struggle. Many women who had never previously been political, even quite hesitant, emerged from that struggle as gifted and creative individuals. And this experience empowered many women to develop in their future lives. During the strike, uh, our mining villages were occupied by large numbers of police, uh, roadblocks were uh, put up, um, and there was lots of uh, secondary picketing and solidarity action. Um, police, uh, it became worse. They had restricted the, um, the, the movement of people, but they, the way that they did police using riot gear, horses, dogs, vehicle sabotage, physical violence, cattling, provocation, verbal abuse, um, all of this um, was set there to intimidate. And women were not exempt from that. Over 11,000 arrests were made, uh, and that included many women who were, um, you know, travelling also to support the miners. We know that Orgreave itself uh, that day on the 18th of June was unprecedented as in terms of an extreme act of police, police violence orchestrated. And our campaign was set up uh, to formally build on the work um, that, that had done, been done by many, but never been pulled together uh, to get some kind of, of an inquiry into what happened during that day. It's important also to mark that today uh, marks the anniversary of the return to work in 1985. And when the miners did return to work, it wasn't with heads down low, it was with banners held high. 
I just want to finish by reminding us all um, that police violence and police violence against women is nothing new. We know women have been at the forefront of political struggle in our trade union moment movement all the time, from the match, make, match women to the chain makers, suffragettes to women's liberation, Grumwick to Greenham, women against pit closures to reclaim these streets. We've seen extreme acts of psychological and physical abuse by the state and the police. And what do we have now? Um, unfortunately, the recent uh, passing of the Covert Human Intelligence Sources Bill uh, means that undercover police officers are exempt um, from the roles that they may play um, infiltrating our actions. The Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill uh, seeks to restrict progress, restrictions on legal aid, plans to limit judicial review against the state are all there um, to, to, to take away our right to protest. We can win. Uh, we remember the achievements of Shrewsbury uh, last year. Um, we have to build on that. We have to be empowered. Uh, we have to continue to initiate change, show support and solidarity and encourage unity. Women have to influence the agenda and discussion and provide a platform. And while ever the establishment attempts to exclude any form of dissent, we have to be louder. We have to be stronger. I'm just going to finish with two of my favourite quotes. Remember what the great Angela Davis uh, says. I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot ex accept. And finally, a quote um, from Mal Finch's fantastic strum that inspired everybody during the minor strike. We are women. We are strong. And we are united by the struggle, united by the past. And it's here we go, here we go for the women of the working class. Solidarity, sisters. Thanks, Chris. I feel absolutely inspired by that. I felt like a call to action. Um, now, we were absolutely delighted to have confirmation that our next speaker was joining us today. Uh, Lucia Munoz Dalda is a leading woman Podemos MP in Spain, where so many people have organised in recent years for a better society as part of a better world. We're so happy to have you. So welcome, Lucia. Hi. Um, first of all, thanks to Arise and all the people that uh, makes this possible. It's an honour to, to be here with all these fighters of the panel. Uh, for me, this opportunity is, is a very great opportunity to, to share some of our thoughts with, with you all. Um, I'm Lucia Muñoz, I'm a member of the Spanish Parliament from, from Podemos, which is a left-wing party that is now governing in a coalition with the Socialist Party. Um, as you probably already know, our party was born uh, eight years ago. We were activists that we, we were protesting in, in the economic crisis and all the political powers and social media powers said that we had to, to become a political party if we uh, wanted to, to change things and, and we did and, and we are now governing the, the state. So uh, in, this, in this way, um, we learned that, that feminism is a key issue for, for social transformation. Um, next Tuesday is, is the International Day of Working Women, probably the most symbolic and crowded event uh, here of the Feminist Party, which is, a, which is very, very strong here in Spain. And the demands of the Feminist Party for us are the cornerstone of our policies. Uh, the, the example of the labor reform or rising the minimum wage um, improves uh, the lives of millions of people, per, but especially uh, the, of millions of women because they uh, have the most precarious and, and lowest paid jobs. So this uh, 8th of March is especially important also because we are in a very complex uh, context two years because uh, after the pandemic and it is an opportunity to remember that, that feminism, 
feminism is against all kinds of violence and it will support peace always. And we defend freedom, the LGTB rights. Uh, so feminism is not only for minorities, is because it improves the quality of life of all the society, the society including including men. Um, as Nancy Fraser, Nancy Fraser said, uh, feminism is for the 99% of feminism is also for the 99%. Um, we think that the feminist life is a happier life also for men uh, who are not forced to, to repeat the roles that have been there since childhood. Uh, don't get in emotional, not crying, no empathizing, not being able to express uh, themselves normally due to the risks of being uh, considered a bad man. So I think men have to contribute to feminism, for example, uh, pointing out uh, the sexism or mis misogyny of others. So uh, we also think that the future, the future demands equality between women and, and men and the, abs the absence of all discrimination. For this, it is a priority that equality uh, be universalized. We cannot understand our society to come if it is not hand in hand with feminism, which is also an strategic, strategical and essential part of this challenge we are facing with a rising far right or um, extreme right parties who only seek for this world to take uh, steps backwards. Um, so the conquest of, of feminism have been the engine of change in, in the past. They are in the present and they will be in the future. The world uh, to come uh, cannot be understood with, with feminist uh, advances. Thank you. Lucia, that was really inspirational. I think it gives us hope that through building links and solidarity internationally, we can together build a better future for everyone. Um, and to have a glimpse at what that better future could look like, we're going to close with hearing from uh, a society that is right now putting collective need before corporate greed. And our final speaker is Camilla Escalante, so journalist for Caucasian News in Bolivia. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's Kausacha News, and we're based in the rural area of uh, the Tropico of Cochabamba. And now we also have a base here in the city of La Paz, the largest city, which is also uh, the seat of government. And today our continent is remembering um, our eternal commander, Hugo Chavez, who passed away on this day in 2013, nine years ago. From here in La Paz to Caracas, uh, to revolutionary Managua liberated territory of the Americas, and Havana and beyond, we remember the teachings of Chavez. The Bolivarian Revolution and led by Chavez, just like the Cuban Revolution and the Sandinista Revolution is what led to and gave way to the most important gains in women's rights and women's liberation in the Americas. So I was asked to speak about the struggle of Bolivia. Of course, I'm not Bolivian. I'm um, a lot of things, uh, North American, uh, also Salvadoran, uh, but I've, I've come here to Bolivia and have lived here for the last couple of years and have learned a lot about uh, the struggle of women, in particular the struggle of indigenous and Campesina women. Um, I just wanted to start with, um, with uh, the, this uh, report that just came out. Um, that I'm just publishing an article on our website right now. I'll publish it as soon as I get off on kausashunews.com. And um, it's a report by the Interparliamentary Union, which released its 2021 Women in Parliament list of countries with the, with the best gender balance in Parliament. And I'm here to tell you that within the top four countries in the world, out of a list of 189 countries, 
three of the top four countries with the greatest gender parity in national parliaments are Latin American countries. And those countries are number two on the list, Cuba, number three is Nicaragua, and Mexico is number four. Not only are these countries of Latin America, which are all obviously leftist countries right now, two of them revolutionary countries, um, they're the only countries with, in addition to two others, five countries out of 189 countries in the world are the only countries to have achieved gender parity in their national parliaments, whether that be Congress, House of Representatives, their National Assembly, which is 50% or more women represented um, in their legislatures. And uh, in Latin America, have, has only has some of the only countries in the world to have exceeded gender parity, which is to say that Sandinista Nicaragua and the Cuban Revolution have guaranteed women's participation, uh, exceeding all Scandinavian countries, all European countries, and Europe only factors into this list of 189 countries in position number seven. Bolivia comes in position number. 11, in 11th place in the world in gender parity. I think this is extremely important. It's extremely important because of all the lectures that we hear about women's rights, about uh, you know the supposed disenfranchisement of women, which does exist and is a problem in the global South. But we are leaders um, in these processes for women's liber liber liberation, particularly on this parity issue, and particularly because of the Sandinista San 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 revolution, the Bolivarian revolution, the process of change led by uh, Evo Morales and the Bartolina Cisas, um, and the unions here, as well as the Bolivarian revolution in Venezuela, which unfortunately did not make it onto this list because of um, you know, reasons I'm not aware of, but um, a very important country for advances in women, women's rights in Latin America. So I've been living for a long time in the Tropico of Cochabamba, which is the rural area. And uh, some of the issues that are very important uh, to women here are things like people want, need, and have been provided because of the economic policies under Evo Morales and his former economic minister, uh, Luis Arce, who is now the current uh, president, access to loans, access to land, and they have been fighting for food sovereignty and the building of bridges and infrastructure to be able to uh, not only to grow their products on their land and be self-sufficient, but to be able to bring them to market, both within Bolivia and internationally. This is a feminist issue. This is a women's issue. Um, these issues have been led by the executives of the unions, and there are women's uh, positions within every executive of every union and also the Bartolina Cisas, which is named after the Campesina indigenous leader who led a fight against the colonizers. Their aim, the Bartolina Cisa Women's Indigenous Confederation, um, is to organize and facilitate women's participation in politics and uh, you know, to allow people to fight for their own uh, liberation. Um, this is extremely important, both in rural and uh, in urban areas. And so, you know, one of the things that, that has just been absolutely amazing and a huge lesson to me, and I think to anyone else who gets to come here and see the women's movement of Bolivia, is that this is women's liberation with class analysis. People understand that there's an economic component, which is very important to our enfranchisement and to the right of women to participate in society and to be able to prosper. We are fighting, uh, you know, not just to be able to, um, walk around and express ourselves in terms of the clothing we wear. Um, and you know, not just because we want numbers um, and quotas in different areas of society, but because we want to be able to uh, empower ourselves and to not have to uh, rely on, uh, on men or anything else. And uh, you know, absolutely the, the, the unions that are led by women and have women attachments um, and components are an example of that. There's also the Plurinational Service for Women and Depatriarchalization. You may have heard of that. You may be able to find some of that on our website. Um, the women's, um, you know, the women's organizations, the Bartolino Cisa is part of the Pacto de Unidad and is also a part of the movement towards socialism, which is the governing party. It's a mass party of lots of social movements and unions, as I'm sure many people have been following, uh, but it's very important that it has uh, women. And we also had great advances 
As you've seen, a lot of really prominent um, leaders in the movement towards socialism, the government governing party here, ha has had very important leaders as ministers, as uh, senators, um, and many of them were persecuted under the coup that just took place in 2019, uh, which was led by uh, a number of uh, far right sectors and Janine Añez, who's being persecuted right now. So just to wrap up really quickly, some of the demands right now, this International Working Women's Day are the, um, uh, one of the themes is the fight for memory, truth and justice, the call for justice against these coup leaders and for the crimes of the coup, because not only did they persecute women, uh, prominent women, socialist women, revolutionaries here, some of them were sent into exile, others had to hide in, an in the Mexican embassy um, and others suffered other kinds of torture, persecution and were jailed. But uh, the, the coup actually did a number to the economies of women and harmed women for far more than men. Uh, I did a video on that as well. So under Janine Añez, this neoliberal tyrant witch, uh, women suffered heavily. They're also calling uh, attention this Women's Day to the double exploitation of women workers, to end patriarchal capitalist violence, um, and to um, end not only femicides, but also the impunity for the crimes that are committed against women. Um, so the Bartolina Cisas and the, uh, and the Alliance of the Women's Organization of the Democratic and Cultural Revolution are convoking a grand march this Monday uh, for the life and security of women is another one of their themes and to demand justice uh, for victims. And we're going to see a lot of ministers, a lot of people from the government and probably President Luis Arce. And so uh, please follow our coverage of all the women's advances and all the different things we'll be doing uh, for Women's Month here in Bolivia on Castro News. Thank you so much for inviting me and for all the organizers and your work. Thanks so much, Camilla. It's great to have you with us today. Um, and thank you to everyone for participating in this whole inspirational day. It was an absolute honor for me to chair this session and hear from these formidable and inspirational women. And a huge thank you to Arise for organizing such a brilliant day. And um, please take on board the action links, including by donating in the link provided so that Arise can continue hosting these important events and follow our media partners, Labour Outlook, plus uh, joining future events, including the Urgent Action Tackle the Cost of Living Crisis event, which is taking place on March 16th. Um, we have heard just now how important our campaign against the Tories reactionary agenda is um, on a number of fronts, and our work for international solidarity and indeed in Labour for socialist policies and Labour Party democracy, which must go alongside all this work. So now we must build a better world and let's do it together. Solidarity, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>